For the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the District 8 City Councilor and also the Chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on, Co on Boston's COVID-19 Recovery. This public hearing is being recorded. It's being live streamed at boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82 and Fios Channel 964. We'll be taking public testimony at the end of this hearing. So if you're interested in testifying here with us in the chamber, please sign up on the sheet near the door. It's that one over there. Um, and if you are watching at home and interested in testifying virtually, please email ccc.covid19 at boston.gov. Um, and we'll, we'll be happy to get you the link. <coughs> so again, that's ccc.covid19 at boston.gov. And if you're watching this after the fact and you want to send us written testimony to that address, that's perfectly fine. We're going to be continuing to consider this ARPA, um, these ARPA doc dockets over more hearings, so happy to receive written testimony. Today's hearing is on docket 0503, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $349,500,000 in the form of a grant awarded by the United States Department of Treasury to be administered by the City of Boston's Chief Financial Officer, Collector Treasurer, from the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund in the Treasury of the United States established by Section 9901 of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, ARPA, and pursuant to the requirements of the ARPA, the grant payment would fund COVID-19 response and recovery efforts and accelerate a Green New Deal for Boston through once-in-a-generation transformative investments that address the systemic health and economic challenges in the areas of affordable housing, economic opportunity and inclusion, behavioral health, climate and mobility, arts and culture, and early childhood and docket 0504, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expand the amount of $40 million in the form of a grant awarded by the United States Department of the Treasury to be administered by the City of Boston's Chief Financial Officer, Collector Treasurer, from the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund in the Treasury of the United States, established by Section 9901 of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, ARPA, and pursuant to the requirements of the ARPA, the grant payment would fund provision of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue of such state, territory, or tribal government due to the COVID-19 public health emergency relative to revenues collected in the most recent full fiscal year of the state, territory, or tribal government prior to the emergency. You can work on shortening these administrative dockets someday. Um, and then docket 0512, order for a hearing regarding allocating ARPA funds to a home ownership voucher program and docket 0547, order for a hearing to utilize American Rescue Plan Act, federal and state COVID recovery funds to create housing options for returning citizens. I've been joined here today by my colleagues, Council President Ed Flynn of District 2, Councilor Michael Flaherty at large, Councilor Liz Braden of District 9, Councilor uh, Aaron Murphy at large, Councilor Julia Mejia at large, and Councilor Brian Worrell of District 4. Um, and before I introduce the administrative panel, I just want to um, let folks in the audience and watching at home sort of get a sense of what we're doing here. Um, the administration introduced a docket back in April for $350 million, which is sort of the remaining unallocated um, ARPA funds that just came to the city as a, in a general block. Um, and so the council is considering kind of how to appropriate those funds. And so the administration filed a proposal for appropriation, which included sort of sub-designations in a bunch of those categories that I read out earlier. So arts and culture, early childhood, economic opportunity and inclusion. Um, we focused on those subtopics at the hearing last Friday. Um, today, we'll be focusing on housing, um, which is also where the administration's proposed um, the lion's share of the funding to go. So I think 206 out of the 350 million. Um, and then on Friday morning, we'll be having a hearing focused on climate, uh, mobility, and then also digital equity at 10 a.m. And Friday at 2 p.m., we'll have a hearing focused on behavioral and public health. Um, so basically, the intent is to sort of give the council a first chance to dig in on these proposals within these chunks instead of trying to do it all at once like we did in the first overarching hearing. And then you will have heard me also mention some other dockets noticed. Um, basically, we've also been encouraging councilors to file proposals of places they'd like to see ARPA dollars focused. Um, and we are co-noticing those sort of by topic area. So uh, the one that um, the order for hearing regarding allocating ARPA funds to a home ownership voucher program, the lead sponsor of that is Councillor Brian Morrell, who's here, and then I think Councillor Flaherty is the second. Um, and then, uh, and I, I'm on it as well. And then docket 0547, the one about um, COVID recovery funds to create housing options for returning citizens. The lead sponsor is uh, Councillor Louis Jen. And then I think it's myself and Councillor Worrell, although sorry, I'll correct those if I'm wrong later. 
Um, so I think what we're gonna do is first go to the administration um, for a presentation and then jump into questions uh, and, um, and also talk about those dockets as they come up. So uh, we're joined here today by Sheila Dillon, the Chief of Housing um, from the Mayor's Office of Housing. Um, we've got uh, on the Zoom, not visible to you yet, but visible later, Jessica Boatwright, the Deputy Director for Neighborhood Housing Development, and then here with us, Rick Wilson, Deputy Director for Administration and Finance from MOH. And then um, also joining us is uh, our Administrator of the Boston Housing Authority, Kate Bennett, um, who was also once my boss. Um, and so if you suspect favoritism, you are right. Um, and now, uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Chief Dillon and Administrator Bennett for the presentation. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, thank you, um, Committee Chairperson Bach and City Council members. For the record, my name is Sheila Dillon and I'm Chief of Housing and the Director of the Mayor's Office of Housing. And it's a pleasure to be here today to provide you with our proposed plan for expending $206 million of ARPA funding. These investments will not only improve our immediate housing challenges, but set in motion actions and efforts that will assist our residents for years to come. The first slide is a summary of the proposed investments. These investments not only reflect responses to our most serious housing needs, but they also represent current realistic opportunities. As you are aware, or may be aware, ARPA funding needs to be committed by 2024 and spent by 2026. And while for many of you this might seem like an ample time, uh, we know that developments and new programs take time uh, and years to design and complete. With that in mind, we have only identified housing solutions that we feel can be acted on relatively quickly. So I'm going to be going through each of these categories in, in some detail, uh, but being conscious of time, we can, we can get into the more details through question and answering. So first, First, to address historical inequities in wealth, especially in communities of color, $60 million will be allocated to promote home ownership for low and moderate income Bostonians. A portion of this funding is to be used to, to expand our current home buying financial assistance programs, including down, down uh, payments, down payment assistance and, uh, for first generation home buyers and the very successful One Plus Boston Mortgage Program which allows first-time home buyers to secure low-interest mortgages. Those programs are successful and up and running. We just need to expand them. We'll also use this funding to support the development of green, affordable home ownership opportunities on remaining city-owned sites. The de this development effort will leverage state ARPA funding through the Commonwealth Builder Program. Another home ownership effort that will use ARPA funding is a program being designed by the BHA this program will assist current public housing residents to purchase a home with the necessary support. And Kate Bennett, the BHA director, will provide an overview of this initiative now. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks, Councillors and Sheila. Um, on the home ownership side, BHA has been working really hard to um, develop strategies to increase home ownership opportunities for public housing and Section 8 residents. And I want to thank especially Councillor Worrell for working with us on this and helping, you know, sort of push uh, these proposals. We've got three strat strategies that are proposed under this funding opportunity. And all of these strategies are the primary beneficiaries would be people, families of color. Uh, we know that we have a few hundred families that are in the 50% uh, and above of AMI range and almost 200 that are over 70% of AMI. And so those families can afford a mortgage payment, but they need significant down payment assistance. And so we're proposing to add a $25,000 increment to MOH's One Plus Boston program to make more of these families eligible for a purchase. We, we've run the numbers and we're comfortable that at that level of additional assistance, many of our families could be successful, and we think that we could serve at least 40 families during the ARPA time period. Secondly, we want to grow our Section 8 home ownership program and add a home ownership component to the city voucher program. Um, our current Section 8 home ownership program allows for voucher holders to purchase a home and continue to receive their voucher subsidy for 15 years. And so that's an incredible. Uh, security to transition from a rental subsidy to home ownership with. It's a relatively small program. We're, we're 
closing maybe five to six transactions a year with that. We think if we could add and invest in the city voucher program, we could bring many more of these voucher holders along into home ownership. Um, the main thing that I want to say about that strategy is it, it really unlocks the home ownership potential for a much lower income family because of the value of the voucher. Normally a family of three earning about 50% of area median income if they're paying about a third of their income for housing can afford about a $325,000 home, which in Boston, you know, there's, there's not a lot, not places to go for that purchase price. But with the voucher payment standards, that same family, their buying power increases to about $500,000. And so we just think that's a significant boost and a unique opportunity um, for voucher holders. Um, and we think we could serve about 40 families during the uh, ARPA timeline with that initiative. And lastly, um, BHA also owns a portfolio of scattered site units that we think is ideal for affordable home ownership, much more suited to that really than the public housing rental um, situation that they're in right now. These are state funded units and the state has indicated um, a willingness to work with us to transition these units. We think long term we've got 50, 50 to 60 units that we could put into home ownership um, with the help from the city and perhaps with a partnership with the community development corporations locally. Um, during the ARPA period, we think probably that's about 25 units or about half of the total portfolio we think we could move during that period. Thank you. So, um, I'll just talk loud. Um, so before moving on, I just did want to present um, some recent examples when I talk about building new homes on city, vacant city land. Uh, we just picked a few just to illustrate for folks that are not familiar with this type of development. Um, the first one is on Wombeck Street in the Garrison Trotter neighborhood developed by Crosswinds. Uh, they, we just designated them for their fourth phase, I believe fourth phase in Garrison Trotter. The next one is uh, on Roseberry Road in Hyde Park, uh, done by uh, Norfolk Construction, um, a real gem of a developer uh, contractor that, we've, that we re recently established a relationship with. These are recently sold. These are two condominium units that feel like single families. And lastly, uh, this project is on Norwell Street and uh, done with a lot of support from the WOW Neighborhood Association for new townhomes being done by um, Travis Lee, thank you. But th that just shows though what we'd really like to take the remaining parcels and using the ARPA funds develop homes like these. Next I wanna talk uh, about our next proposal and this will use $30 million to transform publicly owned land into green mixed income communities. And I, as many of you are aware, the mayor has asked the BPDA to work with city departments to complete a land audit this land audit will include large parcels of land where significant mixed income communities can be constructed. This audit is almost complete and I think within the next several weeks you'll have this information. The Mayor's Office of Housing is proposing to use $30 million in ARPA funding to begin construction on new affordable housing on several of these large sites. And while the sites may take years to complete, the ARPA money will jumpstart both the planning and early development phases of these large scale developments. The Mayor's Office of Housing will coordinate with the BPDA and many city departments to produce well-designed, carbon-neutral, transit-oriented communities that connect low and moderate income Bostonians to good paying jobs and essential services. Uh, two of the examples on this slide, um, one is Olmstead Green, which we're all familiar with, a very, very large state-owned parcel, and the other one, Bartlett Yards. Just to give you a sense of the, the, the scale of, of uh, new communities that we're looking to design and build. Next, um, Mayor's Office of Housing is proposing that we use ARPA funding to combat displacement through strategic property acquisitions. And while we're, while we're excited about new investments in our transportation and open space infrastructure, we know that too often critical investments can accelerate gentrification. In response to this unintended consequence, MOH is proposing to combat displacement through strategic property acquisitions. This proposal would use $27 million to support the acquisition of occupied properties 
and vacant or underutilized land near transit and other infrastructure improvements to preserve tenancies and create affordable housing and economic opportunities. This targeted initiative would build upon the existing AOP program that has helped the city's development partners uh, compete in the speculative market, supporting the acquisition to date of 453 units. MOH would coordinate with the streets cabinet to identify strategic acquisition opportunities in transit corners vulnerable to speculation and displacement pressures. Um, yeah, next, thank you. Um, we also are very interested in using some of the ARPA funding to create additional supportive housing units. And working with many of you, the city has been working hard to increase a pipeline of supportive housing for our homeless population. Our pipeline of supportive housing is very large right now, and we are working hard to advance these projects as quickly as possible. Two of these projects have started construction recently, and they are shown here, 3368 Washington Street and 140 Clarendon Street. While this effort will serve us for decades, our work at Mass Cass has demonstrated the need for us to build additional permanent supportive housing for homeless individuals suffering from behavioral health and substance use disorders specifically. This funding would also leverage state funding set aside for this use. Also, the city is proposing to maintain the temporary low threshold shelter sites for homeless individuals with substance use disorders that we set up last year. In December 2021, the city, as you know, stood up six low threshold shelter sites in response to the humanitarian crisis at Mass Cass. These sites have provided shelter and connections to health care, treatment, and permanent housing. The city is proposing to use some of our ARPA funding to maintain these low threshold shelter sites in fiscal year 23. These sites support people struggling with substance use disorders who are exiting mass casts and the street. The state has also expressed their interest in contributing, their, contributing to the support of these sites, which we are very we're thankful for. These sites have become an important resource as we identify solutions for those living on the street with substance use disorders. This additional year, fiscal year 23, will allow us to incorporate some of this capacity into our existing shelter system. We also are proposing to spend $20 million on deep energy retrofits for affordable housing. Um, MOA has, uh, MOH has been working closely with the Environment Department on how to use our investments in housing development and preservation to accelerate Boston's path to carbon neutrality. We know that, the build, we know that buildings account for about 70% of Boston's greenhouse gas emissions. So quickly reducing building emissions is essential to achieving a Green New Deal for Boston. This investment will focus on existing deed-restricted housing and naturally occurring affordable housing. Retrofitting these homes is essential not only for its climate benefits, but also because these improvements will improve indoor air quality and livability while reducing operating costs. The, this ARPA funding will also serve as proof of concept and build momentum for future efforts to upgrade the city's housing stock. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Kate Bennett, who's going to talk about the uh, ARPA investment proposed for uh, public housing. Thank you, Chief. Uh, so this is uh, very simply critical funding for capital repairs at BHA sites, $33 million proposed, really focused on energy efficiency and air quality. We're proposing to renovate 1,000 units across five sites. Uh, replacing windows and adding ventilation along with some other moisture control me measures. Um, we're, we're really looking to green these buildings and reduce asthma and other issues. It's work that our federal capital budget won't support and so uh, the ARPA funding would allow those, uh, thank you, thanks, would allow these improvements um, to go forward both in terms of improving conditions, but also just the comfort of families um, to move you know, ahead without years of delay. Thank you. I'll wrap up here, um, but to, we have looked at the, the resources that we're asking for and what we think we could accomplish, and I just thought I'd end with summarizing. Um, we think that if these, in, if these investments were put to use right away as we've planned, um, we would create uh, just shy of 1,200 new affordable housing units. 
but as importantly, we would be jump-starting and beginning uh, work on much more. We would assist 300 uh, home buyers, and typically our programs have served, 75% of the, the households served at BIPOC households, and uh, we would help BHA, 80 BHA households buy uh, their first home. We would continue to assist individuals uh, at the low threshold sites. We would complete 300 deep energy retrofits uh, at affordable housing and naturally occurring affordable housing, and the BHA would renovate 1,000 units. So always good to look at some numbers. Uh, that concludes our presentation, and we'll take any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Chief Dillon and uh, Administrator Bennett, and, um, and um, yeah, we appreciate the presentation and also the materials that you all sent ahead. Um, just to remind counselors, that same packet that I sent out now a couple of weeks ago also has further detail on each of these programs. Um, all right, I, uh, I want to note we've also been joined um, by my colleagues, Councillor Ruth C. Lou Jen um, at large and Councillor Tanya Fernandez Anderson, District 7. Um, I'm going to hold my questions um, and I'll jump right into colleagues. So the order just for people's reference is Flynn, Flaherty, Brayden, Murphy, Mejia, Worrell, Lou Jen, and Fernandez Anderson. Um, and we'll start with Council President Ed Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the work you're doing in this field for so many years for your important, important leadership. Thank you to the panel as well. Um, thank you, Kate, and thank you um, to your team at BHA for everything that you are doing, and thank you, Sheila, as well, for your team. Sure. Um, Kate, could I just start with, um, I know you mentioned the Ruth Barkley uh, Cathedral um, upgrades, improvements. Uh, can you just explain to me um, what we're doing there to make improvements, what the pro improvements are, and um, when when that time frame is? Sure. So um, at Barclay in particular, um, like with all these units, we're looking at windows and ventilation primarily. Uh, we have RFPs in development now to um, secure architects and general contractors for that work. Um, upon notice of ARPA funding, we can move forward. It's probably a two-year process after that. Okay, is that windows and ventilation in HVAC or is that just ventilation or? It doesn't include HVAC. Okay, okay. Um, and then the other question I was going to, going to ask you, and thank you for being a strong, your strong commitment to public housing, obviously, um, West Dedham Street, yep. uh, next to Villa Victoria. I was by there um, about three days ago. I know we talked recently about the elevator. Yep. I was so, just wondering if you had an update on that. Sure, so um, the elevator is in design. Um, it should begin construction in 2023. Okay. Um, that entire property is slated for <coughs> a Section 8 conversion um, in the next couple of years as well, which will allow for significantly more repairs beyond just the elevators. But the, uh, the elevators we sort of um, broke out and just put in the queue to get those done. Okay. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be a tremendous opportunity to, for the residents, and as most of the residents there are seen, well, they're all seniors and, um, persons with disabilities, so it's critical to have a functioning elevator, so thank you. Completely agree. To you and your team. Um, let me see what else I have. Um, I know we were still working, Sheila, on the tremendous opportunity working with Pine Street Inn on 140 Clarendon Street. I believe that's 200, is it 200 units over? Mm -hmm on the border of the South End in, in uh, Back Bay? That is correct. I don't the exact number is Casey, but it's right around 200, Councillor. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one, one, one issue that, that I've focused on over the last four or five years, is there an opportunity for us to do any housing for veterans with any of this federal funding? And if so, how can we tap into, uh, you know, veteran service organizations veterans community, but I would, I'd really like us to see if we're able to invest in uh, some housing for veterans. 
So it's, it's a good question. Um, we are, when we look at the large sites that I mentioned, um, that they really could hold, each of them could hold hundreds and hundreds of units. And I think, of course, we have to talk to the neighborhood in which they're located. We have to have some you know, community dialogue, dialogue with elected officials. But the hope is that we're seeing seniors and, and, and uh, family rental and home ownership and additional veterans housing if, if you and others think that that is important. So the sites can hold lots of different types of housing. And I think we would all agree that the healthiest communities are those that do just that. So I would welcome having additional dialogue on, on how to create additional vets housing using some of the ARPA funding. Thank, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and the first time home buyer program, the one, one concern, I certainly support it. And uh, one concern I have is we're hiring city employees to come work for the city of Boston, hopefully that they can buy a home eventually here. Um, but is there a way we could partner with first time home buyers that are also struggling city employees, struggling to stay in the city? Many of them have residency requirements. And is there an opportunity for us to work with maybe some of the unions or maybe some um, human resources personnel here at the city of Boston, but to help some city employees be part of this um, home buyer program? Um, most city employees are eligible to participate in all of our programs. So down payment assistance, the One Plus Boston, they can even buy ho the homes that go on the market unless they're directly involved with those programs. Like, and I think MOH employees can, cannot participate. Um, I ha we have got a recent proposal uh, from a community member to do home buying classes for City of Boston employees. So I think there's a renewed interest and I I'd love to look into this and, and work with you on that. I think it's a very good idea. I think special programs for city employees um, might be seen as problematic, but I think making them everyone aware of the programs that do exist is something we should be doing. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Um, I agree, it could, the perception could be that it's problematic, but when we, when city employees are required to live in the, in the city, um, it makes it very difficult for them to do it on a salary of, you know, 50 or $60,000. Mm -hmm. But I certainly support um, giving city employees the op opportunity to engage in this program. Um, then finally, I just want to highlight my, my good friend that's in the audience, Michael Kane, who does tremendous work advocating for um, low-income residents across, across the city. And just want to say thank you to Michael for your many years of advocacy and supporting tenants. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I have no further questions or comments. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Flynn. Um, and, uh, and before I go to uh, Councillor Flaherty, just wanted to say that um, I was right that just dockets 0512, the first sponsor is Councillor uh, Worrell, the second sponsor is Councillor Flaherty, and then I'm the third one, and then for, the, for docket 0547, um, Councillor Louis Jen is the first one, then Councillor Worrell, and then myself. And, um, and again, just so folks know, um, the reason we co-noticed those dockets was because we wanted to make sure that they were kind of formally before the body in this hearing so that if councillors wanted to ask follow-up questions about the areas of their um, housing interest, they could they could refer to those dockets. So that's mm -hmm. sort of the theory of that. And we're going to keep doing that as more things come into the committee. Um, but I know that already the group spoke to some work that the administration's done in response to the docket that Councilor Worrell's lead, lead sponsor on. So I imagine we'll hear more about that. But anyways, Councilor Michael Flaherty at large, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, the, I just want to get a sense as to the, the ARPA spend um, on ho home ownership versus um, on rental relief or voucher programs. So we have an actual breakdown as to what percentage has gone to home ownership and what percentage has gone to the rental relief or voucher programs. Yeah. Yeah, Councillor, uh, um, again, Rick Wilson, Deputy Director for Administration and Finance at MOH. Um, so none of the ARPA funding is going to rental relief per se. There are obviously, you know, as um, Sheila mentioned, a good amount of it is going to rental programs, rental housing development. Um, and uh, as uh, Kate 
discussed, uh, you know, we're exploring um, using some of it for a home ownership voucher, home ownership voucher program, not a rental voucher program. So none of the ARPA funding is proposed to go to rental assistance or rental relief. Um, we're using um, emergency rental assistance funding. That's another federal uh, funding, COVID-related funding program for rental relief. Um, as far as the kind of the breakdown, uh, just to maybe get into the question, of the 60 million that was proposed for home ownership, we're estimating about 45 million would be for home ownership development and 15 million for um, like home buyer assistance or first time home buyers, first generation home buyers. Sheila, anything else? That's about it. And then, uh, Sheila, my, one of my favorite programs, obviously, is the One Plus uh, mortgage program. But, and then at a recent hearing, we're, we learned that we've, we've lost some partners on that front. So I guess, um, how many lenders do we currently have uh, that are um, that are offering the One Plus mortgage program? And what are those barriers? And I would like to include a barrier that anyone that does business with the city of Boston, particularly our banking business, we use a number of banks for our depository accounts, et cetera, that we make part of that bid, we make it a requirement that they participate in the One Plus mortgage program. So uh, it may not be for some banks. If it's not for some banks, then they shouldn't they shouldn't be getting our depositories, you know. So I want to make sure that we're 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 going to play it straight, and it's going to be a two-way street. If they're doing business and we're giving them funds to hold for us, we expect them to participate in this program. If we are giving them funds and they're giving us the old Heisman, saying, "Ah, oh, that's, that's kind of not what we're that's not how we're cut out, right?" Well, guess what? We're we're not cut out to to making our deposits with your bank. We want to go to another bank, a community partnering bank. So, could you tell us how many currently participate? based on the latest news and how, what, what are those barriers and how can we yeah. encourage them to participate? And if we have to um, talk to the CFO, et cetera, of the city to, when they put that banking business out, our banking business goes out pretty regularly, that we make that a requirement. You know, so no one bank mortgage program, no deposits for you. It's pretty, pretty, it's a pretty simple formula. So um, I'll get you the exact list. I can I'll do that tomorrow or when we compile questions. I want to say it's six or seven banks, but I'll get you the, the exact list. Um, I, I think it's a very interesting idea um, that we require banks that have good mortgage products to participate with us, so I would welcome working with you on that, especially as we, if we are going to put more of an ARPA investment into this program, we are going to need additional lenders. Uh, so I, I would welcome that. Um, Tom Callahan, just as an aside, you know, he recently he went to McBick and they're changing their name and all of that. But I did send him an email the other day and I said, I, we, I haven't seen lending information in a while, right? Who's lending in Boston? Who's providing mortgages? Who isn't? What are the denial rates? So he said that he would compile and get it to me and I'll share that as well. I think it's something that we're not monitoring on a regular basis and we should be. Just for, for, for that conversation, right. everybody needs to help on this and everybody needs to do their part. Right. And obviously, been working very closely with my colleague, Council Orrell, um, on sort of the, you know, creating, I guess, a, a, a unique voucher program uh, to, to Boston homeowners. So I know that, um, and I'm sure he'll, he'll dive into it a little deeper, but um, to date, I guess, the, the amount of ARPA funds that have gone into uh, income eligible home buyers, we, we have a specific dollar amount for that. Is that in the yeah, first phase? 60 you million of, of the 60 million that's come this way? Is there a specific dollar amount that's gone into that? Well, that's what we, we haven't, you know, tapped at where we have to wait, obviously, for your approval before we can tap the 60 million that we're proposing. Um, we did get in the first round of ARPA last year. Um, there was, a, a, it wasn't that much that mm -hmm. was put towards, um, uh, towards home buying, but we can get you that information about how much has been. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, so to, and uh, Councilor Rell, he can go into it, I think, in, in greater detail in terms of just having it be, a, it's a creative solution, I think, that if it could be properly funded. And same thing with, uh, I know Mike Kane is here as well, and he's always been, he's here every year, uh, as long as serving member of the City Council, he has come in every year and has fought um, to the nail to make sure that we're getting sort of a line item opportunity and we're increasing the voucher program. So. I appreciate his efforts over the years and for his advocacy, and I know that uh, but Shailen and Kate know, and Brad know Mike uh, well over the years, and that um, and that he sees that he's on the front lines uh, with tenants in particular, but also mm -hmm. those that are struggling to stay in the city, as we all recognize that that's one of the greatest issues that we, we struggle with as a city to keep uh, Boston affordable uh, and not have ourselves Manhattanized uh, with all the opportunity that we're providing folks. but. Uh, and I speak as someone else from the old Harbor Projects and, uh, and the value of public housing and recognizing that the federal government 
uh, have walked away on its responsibility, but it's, uh, it's those public-private partnerships that we've created. Uh, Kate, you've been uh, a, a participant in, in being able to help revitalize it, all those units, and I know the ARPA funds are gonna go to uh, improve the quality of life in a number of different developments, so it's all good stuff. So I appreciate the work that you do um, in your individual and collective capacities to put people in homes, keep people in their homes, and find home ownership and uh, rental opportunities for folks. So thank you for your time and talents and for all the great work you guys do. Council Thanks, Flaherty, Council. sorry, there are six uh, current lenders. Uh, I've got my phone now as uh, a source of information. People are watching the hearing, and uh, several more are looking at the program. But I do like your idea. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Madam. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Councillor Flaherty. Uh, Councillor Braden? Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you all for being here. Um, let's see. The land audit, I don't expect that there's much developable and in Austin Brighton that's owned by the city. I think we have the public works yard <laughs> and they want to keep it. Nowhere else to put that big pile of salt. So. Um, also in terms of um, strategic property acquisition, are there, are there potential acquisitions in our neighborhood or is that up to us to keep flagging them up if we hear of them? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is up to, I mean, we don't, uh, we're not out there to well, beat the bushes. <laughs> that's not really true. I mean, we, we, I am checking listings every, pretty much every day and sending them to for-profits and non-profits saying, are you interested? This looks good. The price looks good. Check it out. So, I mean, I do it in an informal way, but it, it, typically it is up to the communities to, to be looking out always for a, a good acquisition opportunity. I did meet with John Woods last week. And I said, John, you know, is there nothing coming on the market that, that makes sense? And he said there was not because the prices are so high in Bar Alston Brighton. Um, but we, the money that we're proposing for AOP would certainly be, you know, um, we would certainly consider projects coming from Alston Brighton. We are most interested in, in projects that are, that are by transit improvements because we are seeing as soon, you know, as, soon as you uh, improve transit or other infrastructure, we're seeing prices go up. Um, yeah. But, but we would certainly consider projects coming from all parts of Boston. So then, um, in terms of ex expiring use situation, how, how are we doing with that? Like, I know in, in Brighton Centre we have Warren Hall, and, and I think they're just running the clock out on that one, and their f retail is laying vacant for years, and everything is just, I, it just, do we have any leverage, or do we have any carrots and stick approach to try and, is that, is that a possible acquisition? Is that something that, that's worth looking at? I think it's, I do think it's worth looking at. Um, like, like my presentation, you know, we have taken 450 units out of the market and some of those were very, very, I mean, they're all important acquisitions, but some of them were, you know, on the market, going to change hands and probably would have meant a building is emptied out. So um, I think someone should approach the owner of Warren Hall uh, you know, you know we, we lost that years ago. What's that? If we could figure out who it is. I'll approach the owner if you give me their contact. But but I, I do, you know, we, we're, we're approaching owners all the time, um, especially if we feel a, bu a building could be on the market. It's a good program. And the nice thing about the program and how it, it dovetail with ARPA is that the money goes out the door very, very quickly. So, you know, some pro pro projects take years and years and years to develop and get off the ground. AOPs can happen within months. So the, 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 the timeline, like the turnaround, I think it's wonderful that we have, we have vacant lots in, in Roxbury and Mattapan and places that we can get to it pretty quickly. Um, are, are, is it a realistic timeline that we'll be able to expend these funds in the time allotted before the clock runs out? <laughs> it, it keeps us up at night. Rick and I talk about it every single morning. Um, the opportunity is now. So we're going to have to do things differently than, um, yes, it is, it is realistic. We can do this, but we're going, we're going to have to do things um, more quickly than we have done it in the past. But I don't necessarily think that would be a bad thing either. We've got you know, land to develop, we've got money to spend, and we've got infinite need. Uh, we should all put our heads together collectively and figure out how to move things more quickly. Even, even you know, community conversations should happen you know, more quickly in this instance. So um, the answer is yes. Okay. And then uh, I was just wondering how you know the um, 
the, Mer the office of Ho Merit Office of Housing, as the three programmes of the Merit Office of Housing, Real Estate Management and Sales, and Housing Development and, and Services. And then they have the, home the Boston Home Centre, Neighbourhood Housing, Supportive Housing Division, and Housing Stability. How do all those different bits fit together with, within your department, and, and will ARPA be of any assistance to those? So um, they're all divisions, they're active, uh, very, very busy divisions within the Mayor's Office of Housing. Um, we're very coordinated. We meet every single Monday and go over all of our goals for the week and how we're going to support each other. It's a, it's a very skilled team. The ARPA funding uh, will certainly help the home center increase our home buying, you know, the number of homeowners we have in the city. Uh, neighborhood housing that oversees the affordable housing development would be very, very busy. REMS would be very busy, real estate management, because they would be selling a lot of this land, uh, much of it hopefully to local developers that are going to also uh, benefit from the economic activity. So um, the Office of Housing Stability has a significant amount of funding that they got in, well, they, hopefully they will get into the fiscal year 23 budget. So I think it's probably those divisions that will, will will see the most activity from the ARPA funding. So when a, when a developer buys a lot in Roxbury or somewhere, it's, it's, it's pretty low priced in terms of the market value. And is, are, are there, is it deed restricted in the sense that they can't flip it or ex exploit the, the sure. cash in and make a lot of money out of it? We're selling the vast majority of our land um, for the creation of affordable housing, gardens, urban agriculture, mostly community uses. Occasionally, we'll sell a sliver to a developer if the community gives us a nod and they're supportive of a market rate development, but it's rare. We, we um, work with the community on, on developing a pro an RFP. We put the RFP out. Uh, developers respond. We vet with the community. Uh, but we do sell those sites if, if it's going to be for affordable housing for nominal sums yeah. because we're also subsidizing. Yes. Construction is very expensive these days. Yeah. And, and, and it, I, wish, I wish we had a few of those sites I know. over I, our way. <laughs> I should say that um, like affordable rental, we, we, we do keep deed restrictions on the property. Uh, so people can't just develop and flip unless it's a market rate, which I said is very rare. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have for now. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor uh, Braden. I think the next up is Councillor Murphy. Yep. And then it will be uh, Councillor Mejia and then Worrell. Uh, Councillor Murphy of the floor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. It's always nice to see you. And I do want to say um, shout out to your office and Christine McCory. She walked me through okay. the One Plus Boston, and I had a few people on the Zoom last night. I think it was their second class, so that's wonderful. Thank you for that. It's so important. Um, so a few focuses I have questions on. Um, will we be prioritizing seniors for housing? veterans also um, when it comes to these housing opportunities and buying options we have? In the ideal, <clears throat> once again, I think we're you know, anxious to have conversations with communities about the larger parcels, but I, I, I really believe that communities benefit from having good senior housing for so, so, for so many reasons, right? It's, it's, um, so, I believe that on these larger parcels, um, I would hope that we will see and we'll hear from communities that they want senior housing as a component of these larger developments. Um, it's rare that it's it's rare that we go out to a community and they're not interested in taking care of their seniors or having senior housing uh, in their neighborhoods. So I would assume that uh, that we will see the desire to have more senior house affordable senior housing uh, on these sites. Okay. And veterans also, who are separate from, obviously, yes. seniors, yes, yep. okay. Um, and I know I've put it out there for requests with ARPA funding, but will there be an investment specific to women in recovery shelter? Housing for women in recovery. So, um, hmm. so I, I, some of the, the sites that have been set up, uh, in, 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 from the mass cast efforts, they they indeed are serving women in recovery. I don't think specifically, though, we've got uh, we, we we have that one category where we're saying we need more permanent supportive housing for individuals that have 
substance use disorders. Um, so could that be uh, housing just for women? It could be. Okay. I don't think we've landed on that, so I'd love you know right. your thoughts eventually on that. Yeah, I'd love to follow back on that because it's a specific group we really need to look out for. Um, and lastly, what would you consider a long-term resident? Because my question would be, would we distinguish those long-term residents who have been impacted by past house discrimination to become home buyers? Would that give them? So, um, you mean some kind of prioritization yes, for the programs? I, I think, I think I'd need to know more, and I think we'd need to get our, our fair housing people involved. But certainly open open to it. I hadn't, I haven't given it any meaningful thought. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to love to think about that more. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Murphy. Uh, Councillor Mejia, then it's gonna be Councillor Orell, and then Councillor louis John. Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, uh, Chief Dillon and Kate. You guys have been so incredibly helpful to our office. You know how many crises we've worked on together, and I just so much appreciate how responsive your entire team has Great. been to our constituents. Great, glad to hear thank that. You. Um, so I'm gonna ask you some questions though, I'm just <laughs> Nah, um, you guys are one of my favorite um, departments and I can, and, and everybody knows that, so it's all good. But I, I just have some questions around the, some of the funding and I'm so incredibly encouraged by um, President Flynn and uh, uplifting the work that we're trying to push in our office alongside um, other colleagues around creating workforce development housing for city employees. Mm -hmm. um, we filed a hearing order. We're really pushing to ensure that city residents who are forced to have residency can uh, work and stay here in Boston and a lot of our a lot of our city employees are having to work two to three jobs just to be able to work for the city. And I think that there is an opportunity um, here to really look at how we can uh, allocate some of that funding to help support or even create a pilot program, some stipends, some subsidies, some housing, workforce development housing um, for uh, city uh, employees I think would be something worth looking into in terms of just being able to, to, to support this. Um, and just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts, you know? We have 60 million on housing programs, including using city-owned land to create new housing, and I'm just curious, um, what if any of those dollars can be allocated towards supporting um, city employee housing? So I, I have not, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, we certainly want our City of Boston employees to, to partake in the programs that we have, down payment assistance, buying homes that we're developing. What I haven't ever thought about, it's funny, it's come up a little bit in the last week uh, from some outside folks too, is to really look at can we do set-asides? Can we have a separate program for? I'd like to research it and get back to, back to you and, um, uh, I, I think I just need to research it before I speak and, and, and maybe not know enough, but I would be glad to do that. It's a very interesting idea. A at a minimum, though, uh, what I really have heard over the last several weeks is that we need to be much more intentional about making sure that our employees know what's available to them. Some folks think that they're not a, that they're they're not eligible for or they don't know of, and we need we need to we need to fix that. Um, so let me research whether we could have a pilot or a set aside. I have, I mean, someone mentioned it to me, uh, one, because they cared about city employees, of course, but they also want programs so it helps recruit uh, and retain. So uh, they, were, they were approaching it from that, that angle. So yeah. if I could, let me research okay, and get back you. to you. Thank you. Um, and the majority of the 60 million in proposed funding would be used to develop green affordable home ownership opportunities, right? Can you provide a breakdown of how much money will go towards home ownership opportunities in comparison to say rental opportunities? Right, so we're, what we're proposing is to use at least 60 million. And that doesn't include other sources, just, we're just talking about the ARPA. 60 million for home ownership opportunities, down payment, uh, one plus Boston, 
the development of new homes and the, uh, the, the program to help public housing tenants purchase, which, which Kate outlined. So, but that doesn't mean that some of the other funding and some of the other line items, like developing large sites, we couldn't have home ownership there as well. So I say at least 60, 60 million. Um, and so could we just, for the record, uh, for those who are listening in, could you just define to us how you are defining affordable in this day and age? Because I hear that a lot, but affordable to who? Um, and what, will that look like? Yeah. We, I, I, it's funny, I, I thought about that th this morning. We haven't, um, we, we haven't defined in these programs um, levels of affordability. We often do that work in the community. Um, we sit down with them, we talk about them. Uh, there's a lot of interest in what that means these days, especially, People know this, but our AMIs are defined by many cities and towns that surround Boston, and they've gotten extremely high, and affordable housing isn't affordable to a whole lot of people. So I think we do need to be more intentional with this money and all of our funding to reach lower incomes than we have in the past. Um, so I think we are, in our last funding round, we did that. I anticipate yeah. that we're gonna do it in our upcoming funding round as well, have a much, uh, uh, wider range of, of incomes served. So, but we haven't said in these various buckets, okay. so much here, so much there, right. but it's something we can certainly work with you all in the community on. Oh, we are definitely gonna work on that, Sheila, because the city is unaffordable to a lot of people. Yes. And so I think if we're really serious, and this is about recovery, right? This is really about helping our most vulnerable, um, that we cannot in good, you know, conscious approve any funds that is not going to support those who are deeply impacted yes. by the affordable crisis that we find ourselves in, right? So I just want to push for that, that we need to define what that looks like yeah. and making sure that we come back with some understanding of what that benchmark is going to look like for for these projects. Yeah, I think it's a very fair, <laughs> I think it's a very fair point and and it's, it's one that we are thinking a lot about, especially as the AMIs keep going up and up much faster than you know, incomes are rising right. here. That, that would be the only way you get my support, if they really reflect the need of the people who live here. Otherwise, it's just developing for the sake of developing. Um, and then one last thing before I get the, the chop here, is I'm curious about um, housing for students who are um, aging out of foster care um, DYS, you know, I know that Councilor Murphy identified a few vulnerable populations, but I just really want to uplift that there are a lot of young people. Um, and Kate, you and I have been working on some cases around students who are in college and because of their status, you know, their rental, their rental um, vouchers are at risk. So what can we do to help support some of these young people who are struggling with housing needs? Mm -hmm. Um, I'll, I'll just say what we're doing and then I'll hand it over to Kate. Uh, as, as I think you know, we, we do have a very successful program right now uh, that is helping uh, many young adults that are housing insecure or homeless and are in the last census are, are homeless rates for the, between the ages of, I want to say 18 and 24, really decreased because of those efforts. It's like short term housing vouchers, uh, putting people up in, in affordable apartments, giving them stipends to live with friends and others. I mean, it's just been a, it's been a very creative programs and it's, it's really, is, it's working. It's showing that the investment in this age group, it does work. Um, so we will continue doing that. We will continue making funds available through all of our, our homeless funding. Um, I, we're, we're not necessarily calling out that age population in this, in this ARPA spend. So I, I would just, encourage you to really look yeah. at a lot of these young people yeah. haven't been able to return to school they're struggling to pay mm -hmm. everything so they're if, again if this is supposed to be to help yeah. people post covid and beyond and if we're really serious about closing that wealth gap all of these things are interconnected and i don't want my time to to run out um without just saying one more little thing here <laughs> sorry um is that i think what i have seen is we're always in crisis mode, and I know we have a rental relief fund, 
um, but it's very cumbersome just to go through the process of getting um, financial support. So I'm just curious what if any of these dollars can be allocated for emergency um, housing crisis? Like, do you have a line item or a bucket mm -hmm. that will go towards, like if I call you on a Saturday, which I have, because somebody needs emergency shelter, mm -hmm. um, that there is some direct fund to help support someone so that we're not paying out of our own pockets to put somebody up in a hotel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do have someone on um, call 24-7. No, I mean, we're, we're, we're on call during the day. Um, I'm always on call. But during the weekends and evenings, we do contract out with some very, very talented social workers and have hotel contracts. And we always have, we're always putting families up in those. So um, it, it does seem to be working well, but if there's ever, if you ever think that we, you know, it should be improved or changed or whatever, I'd be glad to hear that. Um, Rick, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the other money we're spending for emergency. Yeah, so there, there's nothing um, in the opera proposal for what you're describing, emergency housing or crisis housing, like, you know, and for um, emergency cases. But in the actual, in the operating budget proposal, there was, I think it was $500,000 that was uh, proposed, recommended for the Office of Housing Stability that could be used for the, that kind of activity. So not in ARPA, but in the city operating budget, which is in our, you know, could even, potentially even better because our hope is that that would continue every year we would have that available to us as opposed to this one-time, one-time source. And just to add, Councillor, we'll, we continue to look at the issue that you and I have talked about before. There's this mismatch between the federal rules around students and where, where what our population is doing. A lot of our students are part-time. Um, they're at, at community colleges. They're working. Um, and so their income is not excluded because they don't meet the threshold of being a full-time student. And so we, we haven't found any flexibility on that issue, but we continue to look at it uh, and open to continuing the dialogue and seeing if there's anything we can do on the policy level within BHA to help, to help those kids. Right, so I, I do appreciate the chair giving me a little bit of grace here. I, I heard that little ding, ding, ding. But I, I, I will just say is that you know, when I think about this one-time, you know, yeah. investment, and I think about all of the people who are dealing with housing um, instability, I do think that we have a responsibility to utilize some of these funds to help support some of these young people. Um, i dealing with some of these crisis situations that people have found themselves in as a result of COVID, and while I do appreciate the whole idea of building more affordable, I do believe that we also need to address the current crisis that folks are experiencing and it might be an operating line item that I'm glad to see that we already had like $500,000, but I do believe in the moment of crisis that maybe potentially Harper through these funds we can allot to help secure, to help some of these young people and other issues that we are experiencing over the next 24 months because it's going to be a hard 24 yeah. months, right? So we can't um, ignore that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Mejia. Um, I want to note that we've been joined by Councillor Gabriela Coletta of District 1. Um, the order now will be Worrell, louis uh, Fernandez Anderson, and then Coletta, and then myself. Um, Councillor Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you to Chief Dillon, Kate Bennett, um, Kate's great team, Joe, Taylor, David, Nick, for collaborating with me um, on the home ownership voucher idea that I think we'll be create. well, I know we'll be creating another two here in the city of Boston that will create wealth, uh, increase home ownership, and um, fight displacement. Um, I'm, I'm advocating for a new city voucher program um, to be its own program that focuses on um, home ownership. Um, in the presentation that Kate gave, she showed us that a family with an income of 50% AMI who would typically qualify for $325,000 um, if we were able to give them that home ownership voucher program, they would be able to buy a home of half a million dollars. That's, that's, that's a real opportunity to make sure that, you know, we're putting families in home here in the city of Boston, especially, you know, those families that have lived in the city of Boston for, you know, a long period of time. So I, I would love to, to just kind of dive into deeper into the Home ownership voucher program. Um, you know more information about the scatter site portfolio. Um, you know the when we're putting um, 
BHA residents into the home into homes. Like now we're also freeing up, you know, a potential public housing, and now we're decreasing that wait list. So this is not only benefiting, you know, creating um, um, wealth and putting creating stability for that voucher holder, but we're we're tackling that. At, I believe it's eight thousand people on the wait list. Can't remember the forty thousand. 40,000 people on a wait list. This, is us, this will be us really tackling that wait list issue that we're having. Um, so yeah, can you just dive in a little bit deeper on the scatter site portfolio um, and the increased buying power that you know, participants in a, in a home ownership voucher program will have? Sure. Um, so, and again, thank you, Counselor, for your uh, work on this and really pu pushing this issue. And, that's a great point that I should have made earlier in terms of, you know, kind of the twofer of, you know, somebody entering the stability of home ownership, but also opening that opportunity to another extremely low income renter. Um, I do want to say the existing city voucher program really was built to serve extremely low income renters in the city. And we're not proposing to, you know, we're proposing that the lion's share of that program keep keep serving that population. We're, we're talking about adding an increment here that would be um, focused on that path to home ownership. And we think, you know, across the three initiatives I outlined earlier, we could probably house at least 100 BHA families between, you know, the public housing and Section 8 program um, through those three initiatives. So um, the condo portfolio that we own uh, was, was created through a, a, a state-funded program in the 80s where uh, the BHA purchased about 150 units from private owners throughout the neighborhoods, pri primarily of Roxbury and Dorchester, but there's units in East Boston and Charlestown and elsewhere as well, a few in Mattapan. Um, they're small properties, they're duplexes, they're three to six unit buildings, and in some of those cases, we own the entire building of condominiums, and in other cases, we just own like a one-off unit in a building that's uh, its own condo association. And in all honesty, this is not a portfolio that is well-suited for ownership and management by the BHA, and it's not all that well-suited to public housing, the public housing program. So we think that these units, um, you know, at least a pool of them that we've identified, again, about 50 units are really, uh, that have moderate capital needs and that we think could transition most easily uh, to home ownership in a process where we're working with the city on the, with, with their affordable housing team, I mean the home ownership team. And then I think also probably with some community development corporation partnerships where there's a local entity that's you know, there to sort of support and manage the capital work that's needed to bring the, the home up to snuff so that it's, you know, we're not saddling new homeowners with poor properties um, and can kind of you know, do the home buyer classes and all of the training and everything that's necessary to get that family ready. I think that's the kind of partnership we're talking about for those, for those properties. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And um, when, when we're creating this um, home ownership voucher program, um, are we able to create like equity applicants or determine who can be the applicant? Like, you know, a lot of my colleagues have mentioned it, have mentioned um, city employees. Like, are we able to say this voucher program, we can say priority can go to, you know, disadvantaged communities, you know, priority uh, city employees, um, you know, can, can we say that if we created a whole new voucher program? Yeah, I would say on, this, on the city side, if we're creating that program, you know, subject to things like fair housing review, there's, there's a lot of flexibility there that isn't necessarily there with our federal Section 8 program. I think it, it partly depends what population we're trying to serve. Clearly, we're trying to, um, address the racial equity gap with home ownership as well. And so, you know, I just think it's, it, it's going to take us processing it a bit to figure out what that, what that right policy is and what the sweet spot is for, you know, how we're targeting those, those vouchers. And in order to get this 
program, what, what is the commitment that we have received, any, if any, from the administration? Or you know, what's, the, what's the ask for this investment for this home ownership voucher program? So for the voucher program, do we have that, Rick? I think I have that here. A million, right? Yeah, but is that for voucher? Is that no, this is total. Yeah, yeah, this is total. So, oh, with renovations, yeah. yeah. Um, guys, any? I think it was a million, right? You could just shout it from the <laughs> from rooftop. rooftop. Well, it's, it's better if folks come down just okay. because the folks watching at home okay. can't hear things shouted from the. Sorry, Councilor. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, I, th I think we've, we've got. Do you mind just providing, I think, the whole proposed budget rather than sure. just one? Sure. So, so, so for across all three initiatives, which includes the voucher program, the additional down payment assistance, um, and the BHA-owned condo pro pro properties, we're proposing $8 million. Um, and how many families will we be able to house in, with the $8 I think million? in the ARPA time frame, about 100, 105. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and Have we received any commitment you know, no, from Chief in terms of that $8 million going to this program? Um, we, we, we really believe it's baked into this ARPA proposal. So I, we are going back and forth on the, I was looking at the um, renovation uh, cost that they've estimated. So I think we have to go back and forth, but I think we are all uh, very excited about this, this proposal. And so whether it's, Six and a half or nine point two. I think you know we these are estimates. So, but we're very committed to to having the BHA program baked into the the home ownership number overall. And the other question I have is the um, city home ownership voucher program. Would that only uh, under the current proposal? Is that only for BHA residents, or would that be open to, like under a new application process? For the voucher program, right? That 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 could be more open. That could be. More I open. mean, because because if they're with BHA, they already have either they're already in public housing or they have a voucher already. Um, so so mostly that would be for new families. All right. Uh, no further questions at this time. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Worrell. Um, and I really appreciate all the work you've been doing offline with these folks as well. Um, Councillor Louis Jen is going to have the floor now, and then it'll be Councillor Fernanda Sanderson and then Councillor Coletta. Councillor Louis Jen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, to the administration for being here and for all of the incredible work that you do. I just want to put a pin in something you said, Chief Dillon. Um, you know, I'm a master's, Maha, Masters Affordable Housing Alliance graduate um, disciple, and think the work they've been doing is great. When you mentioned doing more digging into uh, the state of lending. Um, I would love for you to share that information yeah. once you get it from Tom with the council. And I'd also be very curious to know if we can have breakdowns, right? Because the issue is so th there's been there's not been not enough lending happening and not enough lending in communities of color. Um, and we're seeing a lot of discrimination and, and racism rearing its head in a lot of the home buying process. Um, and so I'd love to see if we have demographic data breakdown on the, what, if you've discussed we, that with Tom. Right, we, we do have very good data on uh, who's participating in our programs. So we'll get that to you. And, and uh, I think it's about 75% of the, yeah. our participants. But, but my, my issue but isn't with our programs or with like the Maha programs or all of that, because I yeah. think that's going to be, I think that we're doing fine there. I'm talking about more on the lending side. I agree. Yeah. So when I get that data, I will share it widely. I, you know, I think we're, I think in the collective, we're all, we all want the right things to happen in Boston, but sometimes I feel like there's not, a, the, the table isn't big enough. And so the bankers need to be at the table as well. I mean, so we really do need folks that are controlling a lot of the, the strings to home ownership and a lot of other things to be right. at the table and make commitments. So I'm in, total, I'm in total agreement with you. Yeah, and so if we are able to get that data um, disaggregated for demographic, right, just as to further, if, if that exists, like I know I'm not, this is not like a formal request, it's not really coming to you, it's more so to, you know, Tom and the work that he's yeah. doing, but I think that would be great. Yeah. Um, okay, now for my the questions here on ARPA. Um, 
So uh, we put in a hearing order um, co-sponsored uh, by with um, uh, Chair Bach and uh, with Council Arrell on housing opportunities and options for returning citizens and formerly incarcerated folks. Um, it, uh, it was born out of a hearing order that we had um, that was co-sponsored by Councilor Fernand Anderson and Councilor Arrell, really looking at the difficulties that folks returning home from incarceration face and how we can really stem the tide of the policy harms that really have led them to the to incarceration in the first place, right? Um, over policing or racism in our justice system, the lack of opportunities and choice. And so on the back end, when we're talking about using COVID relief funds and doing it very intentionally and doing it equitably, returning citizens, formerly incarcerated folks seems to be a good place for us to do that work. And so my hope with ARPA funds is to see our, if, if we're able to allocate a portion of the funds, a million, two million, to exploring a, a, a pilot, whether that be in partnership with workforce development. And this is, you know, it's a conversation that I've had with Councilor Baker about, you know, opportunities in Councilor Orrell's district. I think there are opportunities there. And I think that this money, you know, and I think a lot of these programs are great, right? The, the problem is, is that where do you, it's all about like, you know, it's where do you take from? But I think that that is an important for us to center the, the, the needs that we have for our uh, returning citizen population here who also came and have testified before city council about that need. I do want to shout out Kate and Joel and everyone at BHA who've been doing incredible work with something that I also support more of, the city-based voucher programs, um, and allocating more of those to, um, to the returning citizen population and working in partnership with Justice for Housing that's been doing incredible work here. And I think, uh, you know, I, I understand that there may be some difficulty in allocating ARPA funds for voucher programs, although it looks like we're doing it on the home ownership on the home ownership side. So, I mean, could we potentially also do that here? So, I'll defer to, to, to Kate. Uh, I mean, the, the ARPA funding, and when you, when you think about a program uh, to assist those the returning citizens, do you see it as a, we're, we're gonna help you pay your rent for some period of time while you, you know, get employment support and other supports that you need? Because I think, the, the issue with our, using ARPA funding for vouchers is that it's it's time limited, right? So it's like one time. Yes. You can pay for a year, you can pay for you know two years, but it, it will come to an end. So I'm just wondering if you've thought about that. Well, I'm gonna throw a question back at you. <laughs> um, with the home ownership voucher program that we, that in the Council of World has been championing, where, um, how does that work? Because that would be ARPA funds as well that we'd be using and that's a voucher ongoing program, so. Right, I mean, I think, I think we're, we're seeking funding to kind of start that program and then what we would need to continue it through other sources. Yeah, and so, um, and, and I think that that's, you know, a lot of this upper money, one-time money, sure, but a lot of it hopefully is that in the future we're able to get an allocation via the operating or mm -hmm. find other, explore, uh, explore other ways. And so I think there are really great ideas in community for us to think about whether that is, you know, temporary rental support yeah. or that's more creative housing options that partner with like, workforce development opportunities. We're talking about vulnerable populations um, and how, how important housing stability is to uh, like ensure that, to reduce recidivism, um, to you know, provide a basis for then you know, being able to see your kids, uh, being able to do all of that. I think, it's, I think it's an important cause and that's why we filed the hearing order. Great. Let, let me just um, respond with a couple of points, Councilor. Um, I, in terms of the city voucher program, the, the ARPA funds that are proposed are really for um, joining down payment assistance with the city voucher program. So it's really on the cat city's uh, capital budget and, and other so funding sources that are, are proposed to fund the vouchers themselves. So, but it's, it's, the, it's the additional supports that are needed that would come through the ARPA funds here. So, uh, it's, there's not a cliff on the vouchers themselves. Um, what I want to say on the issue of returning citizens is um, what we found, and we, and we house hundreds of returning citizens every year. Um, they do have to go through a mitigation process, and a, 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 a nonprofit like Justice for Housing really helps that process. Yeah. 
And although I'll never turn away funding to VHA, really I think that the key to unlocking scale in that, uh, in that process is really funding more supports to the nonprofits that are providing services and helping folks make that transition and make a successful transition. Because mm -hmm. we, we don't do that work. And so it's uh, enormously helpful to us when we go through the process of reviewing documentation about somebody that's been incarcerated and, and you know, uh, what they were incarcerated for and how long ago it was and what, you know, what the mitigating factors are, to have an organization standing by them saying, we've been working with this person, you know, they're, and, and sort of vouching for them and we're gonna be there once they're housed you know, that makes a huge difference for us, and that's what, what's made that pilot with Justice for Housing successful. Thank you. And I uh, also support uh, us supporting nonprofits that are doing the work like Justice for Housing, um, uh, like all the way. I just also think that we should be thinking about specific allocations, because part of the reason, and, and you know, we talked about this with your team, is a discrimination that rich, you know, formerly incarcerated folks face in the housing process itself. That's why, more so than I think any other population. And so that's, you know, we could talk about that offline de debate, but um, that's why I think having a specific allocation for a pilot program for returning citizens um, in addition to supporting the great work of nonprofits, right? There's, there's Justice for Housing, there's New Beginning Reentry Services, there are really great organizations in our communities that are doing the work. I want the city to think creatively about how we can allocate these funds that are rooted in the principles of equity and supporting communities that have often been excluded um, in creating stable housing options. Yep. Oh, and the, is that my time? It is, but. Okay, um, just around AOP, I know that there was a 20 million allocation last year for um, AOP from ARPA funds. Has that been ex it's, expanded? I, I think we have a pipeline. I can get that information. For, I think we have a pipeline against that with projects. And that would be the 20 million combined with the 27 that we're allocating. Correct. And then there was a $2 million, I think, line item for community land trust yes. that has not been, dis that is specifically for community land trust that's right, not been that, dispersed. Right, uh, and, I, and I, Jessica's on. Jessica, are you still there? <laughs> She's still here. Jessica. Yes, I am here, sorry. Okay, Jessica, can you uh, give the council an update on the land trust fund? Sure. Uh, yeah, hi. We've been working really closely with um, the Citywide Land Trust Association on getting them those funds. We're just hammering out some details of, related to um, ARPA requirements to make sure that they can fully leverage it to see the kind of development and acquisitions that they're hoping to do. So um, I, I'm hoping that we have the details on that program and the transfer of funds done very, very soon. Um, it's just taken a little bit longer as continued guidance has come out about the ARPA program. Okay, thank you. And then, Kenzie, uh, Chair ba Woman Bach, if you just allow me one indulgence, is that under the AOP program, do you see there are certain nonprofits or community groups that have a certain, uh, I think the work of AOP is the, probably the most important work that we can be doing in housing, right? We're talking about people who are already in housing and safeguarding that. And so I think that we need to be supporting that with a lot more money and resources. So this is a good initial investment, reinvestment. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm curious whether you think that there are some organizations that struggle a little bit more under the AOP model and what we can be doing to assist their ability to thrive and to be able to compete on the competitive um, you know, market um, that is very extractive and that's often hard for them. And maybe they don't have a profit-making model, but I think those are the organizations that we should be supporting the most, so if you yeah. can talk to that. So I, I do think that there are certain organizations and, and owners that have embraced this more than others. Um, buying an occupied building, uh, some folks feel it is an opportunity and mission. Some, some organizations feel like it is something they don't, they, they feel very unequipped to, to, um, to do. <clears throat> we encourage everyone to buy buildings in their neighborhood, everybody. Um, I do think that some of the Organizations in very very high cost areas are struggling are struggling more, although we are being recognizing that we do want 
uh, buildings taken out of the market in Chinatown and Back Bay and, you know, and, and certainly around Nubian, et cetera, which is becoming more and more expensive, we, we are going above our caps uh, if we can underwrite very quickly and feel that it's justified. So um, we, are, we are being more flexible on, on the caps these days, just recognizing what's going on in the market. But I agree with you if there's a way and Jessica just came back, but I, if there's a way that we can, if you're hearing things that, of, of things that we can do, besides just more and more, more, more money, to make the program work better for, for, for folks, uh, then I, I would, we would love to hear them. Thank you. Um, thank you. Well, and can I just add, sure. Counselor, that um, it just because this is a public hearing, I want to say I do think one of the barriers sometimes is people just haven't talked to us yet. And we take phone calls all the time from developers who are interested in getting involved. And my team is ready um, on the phones, on Zoom, to chat with people about how to get engaged with this. I know it's not always that simple, but I really do want to encourage people that the goal of this program is to make it as accessible as possible to keep people from being displaced. And so we happily talk with folks um, as frequently as we can about engaging new buyers in the program. So we're happy to talk to people. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, okay. Uh, next up is going to be Councilor Fernandez Anderson, then Councilor Coletta, then myself. Then I am going to go to public testimony because I know we've got some people who've been waiting here from the beginning. So just for a flag for councilors, I don't think we have too many, but I'm just going to take some public testimony and then do second sure. round. Um, uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. How y'all doing? Good. You fit this. Um, and yes, uh, Councilor Lujan, that was indulging. All right, all right, no crosstalk. <laughs> Councilor Fernandez Anderson. <laughs> um, can you, um, so I think Councilor Mejia did speak about affordability, and mm -hmm. I think we do know the numbers. And just for the record, I, for my district, I can speak for my district, I know that affordable, and then there's two facets of this. One, what's affordable in people that are in my district and how they're living, and as well as what, where they should be built, right? So one of the issues is that the average AMI for Roxbury, and particularly not D7, but Roxbury, is uh, just 30, which is unfortunate. And then it goes, and it, and it goes higher as you get to like lower 20s and then very low, I think $19,000, something like that in income to like towards your 60s. So as you get older, people have retiring with less money and as you get, and the younger people are making more money. So affordable or what you're, or what I think the city is starting to call deeply affordable is like 30% AMI, 40% AMI. And so that I think presents the issue where people, I, I, for the most part in community uh, meetings or housing processes, people are saying, we need affordable affordable rental in Roxbury, in D7, and, and South End bears some of this too, um, because we our average income is this. The issue there is we're trying to house the unhoused, and then for us to, and then we also have this um, effort, or we want to mix income communities, because we know that we don't want to perpetuate the cycles of you know, uh, lower socioeconomic class. So we want to mix incomes, we want to revitalize uh, business areas and make sure that there's mobility and opportunity for people. However, in my district in particular, there's some MOH owned or city owned land that is being proposed and Roxbury just can't bear the responsibility of affordable rental any longer. We're already up to, I think, 75%, and that doesn't actually resolve the issue. Mix, mixing the income will, will perpetuate further displacement. Affordable rental will perpetuate further displacement, and we know that we need home ownership opportunities, not affordable rental. And I think that the counselor, my counselor colleagues has proposed, have proposed ideas to create these opportunities. 
And I've proposed something to create these opportunities, and I think that we are looking forward to collaborating with you, and we've expressed that we're looking forward to collaborating with you on these ideas. Um, that, 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 I guess that leads me to ask you, where else can you build, not Roxbury? Because this ecosystem or uh, living that we want to create in Roxbury is to increase quality of life. That means more green space, more arts, more urban farming, more anything else not affordable rental. If you're going to create affordable home ownership, it doesn't mean go into lower income communities and build them because you have low income people there. It means that you go to the North End, Beacon Hill, Fenway, Alston Brighton. <laughs> I know, she has no land. Um, but you, it means that we go anywhere else. Mix them up where the people have money. Go put them in West Roxbury. Anywhere else, not in Roxbury. What do you say to that? I... Um it's it's complicated, right? Because when you go to community meetings in Roxbury, you'll you'll hear you'll hear that, and you'll also hear people say that people are being pushed out and they need additional affordable housing for uh, very low income populations. Um, I do I really do think you can do both, and I think we would all agree that mixed income communities are are you know they're they're probably what we should all be striving for. Roxbury is, uh, the housing stock is 54%, I've said it be, before here, it's 54% of the housing stock in Roxbury is deed restricted affordable. And Beacon Hill is 6%. I'm not, I'm sorry, Councilor Buck, I just sort of looked at you automatically, I didn't mean to. I know you're working very, very hard on some projects I in am. Beacon Hill. I am um, so <laughs> she is, I'm, I'm here to say she is working hard on those. So I, I think we do need to make sure that we're building affordable housing in, in all neighborhoods of the city, especially where there is lower than the, the, the citywide percentage. Um, I, I do think, though, on these larger sites, and um, I know I'm putting a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm putting too much on them, but I think we can have a mix of unit types. I think we can serve different populations. I think we can have mixed income, in, incomes. So I think we can see, um, I think we can, we can realize a lot with the, their development. I know because I've seen some of the results of the land inventory, not all of our large parcels or small parcels are located in just Roxbury or North Dorchester. They really are throughout the city. So I'm hoping to see a lot more affordable housing throughout the city. But I think, you know, we, we've had some really interesting conversations, especially around Nubian with all the land development. Those conversations have been really thoughtful. Um, uh, a lot of the community, as you know better than I, have supported a Senhai model that it's a third, a third, a third. So I, I think we just need to roll up our sleeves and have those really important conversations. Thank you. And, and, and it's not a conscious. Just add, oh, sorry. If I could Hi, just Kate. add. Hi. Um, with, through some of our redevelopment work at BHA, we are adding surplus units, i.e. not preservation or replacement units, but adding new affordable housing in Jamaica Plain and, and South Boston. And we also have been planning a couple projects in Mission Hill. I guess, you know, and it does, I guess that sounds like a contradiction. Um, we don't want it here, but we need it. But what they're saying is, we want to stay in Boston. We don't want to leave Boston. Not, we need it as in, we, are, we now live in Boston, we currently living in Roxbury, so we need to stay in Roxbury. What they're saying is, Keep me in Boston, and, how, and please help me to find housing that I can afford. That's not a contradiction. That's saying, I need affordable housing. It doesn't have to be in Roxbury. And then, so Roxbury is angry because they're saying, whenever you can pull on our heartstrings about affordable affordability, then you give us you, the responsibility, or we have to bear the brunt of housing the unhoused. Um, and so I would love to explore that with you. I, you know, obviously we are coordinating and we'd love to look at this uh, inventory of empty uh, lots mm -hmm. or land that you have available mm -hmm. throughout Boston and so we could better coordinate so that we don't end up back where, back here, right? Um, what, in terms of your plan in place for, um, or low threshold housing, how are you planning to segue those people 
into uh, permanent housing or sustainability? So it's a, it's a fabulous question, and, and um, we have started to see the six low threshold sites. Um, we've started to see the individuals living in these, um, these sites really start to engage um, uh, more with housing navigators, recovery, uh, just their primary care physician. Um, so uh, as of, I, I thought it might come up, but um, so uh, uh, 25, so, some people have left, they've gone back to family or, or left the sites, but 25 we know have been housed and 88% are working on, on a pathway to housing. They're really engaging on a very regular basis with, we call them housing navigators, or they have a housing resource in, in hand that they're now, because of they've gotten rapid rehousing or they've gotten um, Section 8 or they've made it through the wait list of the BHA, so they're act they have a housing resource. So I, it, it's working with those folks every single week on, on figuring out what's the next step. So we're starting to see more progress with this population than we did like early on, which we're very encouraged by. So the same can be said for returning citizens? Yes. Oh. Well, then we well, can. I, oh, I, I agree that I think if we have intentional, good nonprofits working with, with folks that have barriers to housing, we can make progress. So it could be sustainable because ARPA money is being spent on this. So ARPA money can also be spent on something else that has a challenge of being sustainable. Right. A lot, most of the, I will say most of the people that are in the six sites that have active substance use disorders are getting short-term rental. So they're getting rental payments. We're going to assist them make their rental payments for a year, year and a half, and sometimes if we, if we can renew. What we have found, and I, um, I should have better data in front of me, is that a lot of the folks, those folks can make their way, right? They get into treatment, they get in more stable housing situations, they go home. Which most have a quarry. Yes. Um, I don't know a that lot. for sure, but I, yeah. I assume you're probably correct. No, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, but they are not long, we're not providing, because we don't have the resource, we're not providing long-term uh, subsidies, we're providing fairly short-term subsidies. Thank, last question, Madam Chair, if it's okay with you. Um, I'm being indulgent today, go ahead. I'm, I'm following my colleagues' footsteps. Um, sorry. I, yeah, so I guess, I guess, you know, in terms of like sustainability, the question, I, you know, this begs the question of like, could, could this be seen as systemically racist then if we're looking at returning citizens as something that cannot, like, or housing for returning citizens not being uh, provided or funded by ARPA? because of sustainability um, issues, um, then why are we doing it with low threshold housing, which has the same issue or barriers? I think I don't know enough about uh, the, the, and I can certainly would, would like to know more of the housing needs of returning citizens. I think I, I really do need to know more. Like, what's a, what's a successful program look like? How long do people need supports? What kind of supports? I think I need some, I need, I need better information, and I would welcome working with both of you or, or as many uh, as interested uh, on this. I, I'll be the first to say I, I probably need better information and better data than I have right now, but it's certainly something we would be glad to work on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, Councillor Coletta? It's okay, just don't touch it. There we go. There we go. I'm learning, two weeks on the job. Um, sorry uh, that I'm late. I hope that my questioning is not repetitive, but I've been trying to listen in, so just look, uh, thank you for your patience, if that's the case. Um, but I am pleased to see the, the large investments to down payment assistance for first time home buyers. As somebody who joins thousands across the city to one day own their own home, um, I, am, I am hopeful, so thank you for that. Uh, East Boston in particular has bared a significant burden of development in the city for the last five years. So we do need affordable rental and home ownership opportunities that are truly affordable and that reflect the AMI of, of the neighborhood. So to me, this proposal is a great start. I can't wait to see the land inventory whenever that is ready, um, just so that we could see where the opportunities are to evolve and, and grow to the inclusion of folks that live um, in the community. So just diving into specific programs, I am pleased to see the $27 million to combat uh, displacement through strategic property acquisition. Um, as you know, we're going through a severe displacement crisis in East Boston. 
uh, affecting predominantly our, our Latinx community. And so this AOP program um, has been important already in East Boston. So I love the fact that it is expanding. And thank you to Jessica for her work on this. And thank you, Councillor Louis-Jean, for asking a question around the 20 million allocation from last year. Um, and just a point of cl clarification, earlier in the presentation in this proposal, Sheila, you said, sorry, Chief, uh, that you're working with the streets department to identify at-risk properties in transit corridors. Can you just speak on what that process looks like? And are you currently taking referrals of, of any properties as part of this program? So there are, there are people in, in the mayor's office of housing that are having direct conversations with uh, the streets, uh, Yasha uh, and, and his staff on what the um, upcoming improvements, uh, street improvements, rapid, rapid bus lines, et cetera, that are significant okay. and fearful that, I mean, it, it shouldn't be that if you improve infrastructure, rents go up and desirability goes up, but it does happen. So we thought instead of just saying, this is gonna be AOP that's available to every corner that we would try to be more targeted and say we're gonna have impact on where there has been, uh, in, where there has been inv recent investments or we anticipate mm -hmm. there's going to be investments. And you'll notice, I think, in the language too, we talked about um, other infrastructures like you know, green space and walkways and East Boston comes to mind. I mean, that, the, the waterfront is, is magnificent, but it certainly, it, there, there, was a, there was, I don't think unintended consequences, but there were certainly consequences to, to, the, to the making that so public and so wonderful. Um, we really did start to see the gentrification of East Boston. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And so what you're saying is you are working with the streets department to identify areas where you need to have mitigation. That's correct. To pro okay, okay, that makes yes. sense, and thank you for that. Um, and I'm also happy to see that you're being flexible with the cap as well. I know that this was an issue that our CDCs have been dealing with for a long time. Is the current cap still 100, 125? I want to say it's 120. I'm looking at Jessica's name. I think it's 125, but it's a it's a hundred. But we are working okay. with. Okay, it's. I think uh, we're. I think we're busting the cap so so much. And now in my mind, it's 125. That's the new cap. But but it is a hundred. But we often go over that. Okay, yeah. and this program is accounting for that and also taking into consideration construction uh, costs that are rising right now? Yeah, it's, it's because the, these, um, these have life safe, some life safety improvements. There's not a lot of construction that goes on with them um, when, they're, when they're purchased. Um, they're, but we certainly are taking into consideration higher acquisition costs and, and you know, even the small amount of construction is, is more expensive. Just switching to the program to assist BHA residents with pur purchasing a home. Um, this is creating a bridge where there's usually a cliff. So thank you for that. I know we've talked about those between the 50 and 80% AMI range and how they just need that little bit of help to propel yeah. them towards home ownership. And this is doing just that. So I just want to commend you, Kate, for this proposal. Uh, Joel Wool, my former colleague, and Dr. Taylor King, and also uh, Councillor Warwell for, for putting this out. Uh, but my question specifically on this is what that process will look like if you even know what it looks like from start to finish for, I think you said it was 100 to 105 families who could benefit from this during ARPA. And, you know, would the family have to apply? Would you proactively identify these families? How would, how would that work? Yes, yeah, so um, thanks, Councillor, for that. We, we have identified families within our portfolio already, both on the Section 8 and public housing side that are in that income band above 50 percent we've done some surveying to gauge their interests there's a lot of interest as you might imagine in moving to home ownership and the key issue is definitely down payment assistance and so um you know there's a few strands of this i think you know once we knew we had funding approval on the city voucher program we would hire somebody to begin to do that outreach um, draft those policies we would you know we have an advisory committee already for the uh, existing rental city voucher program and we could um, you know look to that committee or p perhaps expand that committee to also take on this other initiative but i think you know it's really once once the funding is there um, we have a lot of fl flexibility internally and at the at the city to kind of move forward the condominium program, I think, will take a little longer because it's, 
going to require possibly special legislation or at least state approvals that will take a while um, in terms of their regulatory structure to kind of release those units from the state public housing program. So I would expect that would be a slower build um, over, over a maybe two to three year period. And you did mention that there were some areas in East Boston and Charlestown that would be a part of this condominium plan. Yes. Can I have that list? Yeah, okay. absolutely. We'll send it to you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Remaining time? Oh, you got two minutes. Okay. Uh, the proposal to utilize our city-owned assets to build the one of three families, I think that's great um, that you're, usually, that you're um, using the Commonwealth Builder Program as, with mass housing. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a sense of whether or not you can utilize these, uh, these ARPA funds for deals already in, in construction? or that are in pre right. construction it's um you, it's i think it's a trick question that maha put you up to um so I promise uh, they did not <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we have um pledged that these will be new developments that don't have funding already um identified um because mark uh at maha really wants this to be but for money like if we didn't have this arpa money that set aside for these new home ownership projects they wouldn't happen so, um, but we're going to be looking very closely at, you know, how quickly our spend, because we don't want to send any of this money back. But the, so the answer is no for ones that have already I, have identified housing sources. Uh, we are looking really at the, 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 the more remote pipeline or projects that we haven't even started a community process on. Okay. And I promise you can check the record. I did not coordinate <laughs> with Maha for that question. Before you do everything you need. Um, but that's, that's it for me right now. Chair, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Coletta. Um, and now I'm gonna ask my questions and then um, I'll go to the five folks who I have signed up for public testimony. So that's Michael Kane um, and Barbara Waters uh, and then Hilary Pizer, Minnie McMahon and Leslie Cradle. Um, if anybody else signs up subsequently for public testimony, we'll take it again right at the end, but I'm just gonna take those five after my go. Um, all right, and I'll give myself a timer so that we're not way out of control here. Um, Thank you, thanks to the team. Um, obviously, lots of stuff that's dear to my heart and the BHA stuff, um, things that I imagine I would be working on if I had a different life right now. So I'm grateful to everyone sitting up in the gallery there. Um, Joel, Nick, uh, Taylor, and David, uh, who's probably watching in the ether. Um, I was on the, on the BHA front. Um, within, if, we, if we talk about that eight million, Sheila, can you help me understand sort of within the 60, how we're thinking about the breakdown. You mentioned 45 and 15, so 45 for new creation, 15, how does that split between like sort of one plus and stash and whatever, how should? Yeah. I don't, I mean we, the 15 was for down payment assistance and, um, and uh, one plus Boston. So some of the BHA uh, enhanced down payment for their BHA program would come out of that bucket uh, when the BHA is um, says that they, I believe them when they when they identify that they have this uh, the condominium resource but need funding to renovate them that would that would certainly be coming out of uh, the the 45 million that we've almost arbitrarily are you know uh, uh, identified or designated for more construction type activities uh, if we can. Um, if we can get some Commonwealth Builder money for this program and for the condominium development, then maybe that number would, the eight million the BHA is putting forth might even come down. So I think we need to, I think we understand the down payment and the one plus Boston component. I think where we, we need to do additional work is to understand the actual cost to renovate the condominiums. Kate, would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, great. And, and I would just stress, just to put it on the record, I know it's the intention, is that the intention of this would not be to lose any net state public housing units, but to, but to have an a agreement with the state where we added public housing in a two capacity way that would work and then turn these into home ownership because they're better suited to it. Yeah, that's the state law. And so um, unless we were gonna seek an exception to that to, to allow for some of these units to transition over from public housing to affordable home ownership, we would need to replace them. And that's the first desire to do that. It's, it's possible at some point we will propose also to convert some. 
Right, and I, I just think, I mean, as you know, I think that there's a number of places that we could add more public housing units, which transitions to my next point slash question, which is, of course, again, Sheila, this idea that when we're talking about the 30 million and developing housing on public land, making sure that we're really thinking about how to leverage the fair cloth resource to buy down affordability of some of that. Um, I, I mean, I do Great. really want low income housing in Beacon Hill. I've talked about putting those units over the West End Library. Like, just can you speak a little bit to that? Because I'm antsy that we, I feel like that's the way that we're going to get truly affordable to Councillor Mejia's point housing in some of these city potential developments. We are in total agreement. You'll be happy to know that we're now meeting every other week on Faircloth internally. Um, for, for people in the audience that don't uh, know what Faircloth is, it's a, it's, it, it's a, Actually, I won't even explain it well, but it, it will provide a, a it will provide a subsidy and, and almost new public housing units in in some of the larger developments that we're contemplating. I think when we put out the RFP for the for the properties for the land, we actually almost need to um, require the use of fair cloth for some of the buildings. Um, there's been some hesitancy because it doesn't pay quite as well as the Section Eight project based, etc. Yeah. So I think we do need to to now require it. And I think that the, the path of getting it to be new public housing to RAD has made it much more viable, but I feel like our folks are just, like the potential developers out there, even in the nonprofit space, are just unfamiliar with that, so there's a little bit of hesitancy. I agree that we have yeah, to agree. help agree. get folks over. Um, we will follow up with on the request from Councillor Lujan about the sort of AOP spending to date pipeline. Obviously yes. the council was very proud to appropriate that money and the CLT money. My office, Councillor Lujan, has been carefully tracking the two million for the CLTs, and I share some frustration. Again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it on these folks. I think the ARPA regs sort of changed slash were clarified, uh, like right around the time that the money would have been transferred otherwise, and so they've been trying to work within that. But I just want to stress how important it is for us to get that out. Fortunately, because it's ARPA money and not budget money, it's not turning into a pumpkin on the 30th of June. So it's still there for our CLTs to use, but we just know the need is so great. Um, so we'll follow up on that. Um, I think on the question about workforce housing for city workers, I think it would be really helpful for the council if, um, and I don't know, Sheila, if this is sort of an ask for your office, um, but if you guys could maybe pull together a bit more information on the partnership programs that we do have with some of the city unions, because my sense is there's like great variability depending on the type of city worker you are and whether there's like good stuff available in partnership with the city through your union. Like I think, I think the firefighters have a good program. I think that the teachers have a good program, but I think a bunch of other folks don't. And so I just think, I think actually that's where we've gone before to help try to solve this problem when it's been a problem in the past. And it feels like to Councillor Mejia's point of a, um, like a pilot, I think, something where we could build on these programs that are open to all, but the city worker is gonna be able to bring some resource where we've partnered with the union in the same way that like the BHA folks here are gonna build on our existing programs, but because they're BHA tenants, they're gonna get this sort of additional bump of, of down payment assistance. Like it just, it feels to me like, yeah. especially with the interest rate market being where it is, we need like everything to be additive right now. Right. We, we can, I, I hadn't yeah. thought of that. It's a really good idea. We, we can certainly do an inventory. Uh, I know AskMe has a program, SEIU has a program. Um, I'm, I'm, but I, why don't we have staff see if they can't itemize it and see what it's What's showing What's even us. going on? Because I, I just feel like it's a little bit too well kept of a secret, maybe even from some union members in terms of like whether people are aware. And it might also be a place for advocacy and conversation for the council with the unions like, oh, we're hearing that, you know, these members of yours can't really access that because of X, Y, Z conditions. Is there a way we can open that up? I just think that that might be mm -hmm. a path to follow on this. Okay. Um, on the green housing, um, so I think this money being in here is really important because I think we all know that what we've done is with Birdo, we've put a really big onus on our building owners to figure out how to do deep green retrofits, and it's great and it's critical from a climate perspective, um, and we think that our market rate owners can plan and figure out how to do that. I think with our affordable housing stock, it's obviously a stress for everyone to fit it into their budgets and figure out how they're gonna do that. So, as you know, Chief, one of the things that I've been stressing on this money is that, like, it will all be spent in the end, but then there need to be things that are lasting, and 
where it's a program thing. When you build something, you know you're building something that's gonna be lasting. When, you, when you're doing a program thing, it needs to be like, how is it participating in a systemic solution? So I guess to that end, what I'm curious about with the green building is like, how do we make sure that we don't just like pick a couple of lucky affordable housing developments and help pay for their green retrofitting, whether it's BHA or other ones, but like mm -hmm. we actually come out of it with, oh, we like learned this is the sort of like kit of parts that we need to do an effective green retrofit at, a, at an affordable price, or at least we know how much it is per unit. Um, and have we, how much have we talked um, with kind of the, the broader community about like potential sort of areas we need to solve for. So I'll give an example. I know that uh, Lydia Lowe's involved in this Chinatown, um, it's like Chinatown Light and Power or something, but I have the title wrong, that's focused on a microgrid solution. And mm -hmm. they're trying to think about starting out with some affordable housing in both the townhouses and maybe Castle Square and stuff in Chinatown. Um, but what they were saying is that in all the state subsidy programs, what it doesn't really help you solve for are the batteries to like hold the energy so that you can use it at the off peak times. And so they were like, could the city potentially step in and support that gap? And so I just feel like we really know, we've all kind of done the gap analysis on housing, but I'm not sure we've really done the gap analysis on retrofitting. So can you just speak a little bit to where, where we are and how you're thinking about that? I'm gonna hand, Jessica, right on time. I mean, I am gonna hand, <laughs> Jessica's, I'm gonna hand this over. She's been closest to this, if it's all right with you. That sounds, sounds great. Like, very good, thank you. Right. Thank you, and thanks for the questions. Um, you know, I. I don't have the whole answer in part because we really want to have this conversation with council today to understand um, your perspective and your interests. But I think a, a couple of thoughts. First, that this is really a, a deep green retrofit program, right? It's not just a standard, let's try to make buildings greener, but it's really let's invest in projects that are going to become zero emissions projects. And so it's very focused on that end goal of how are individual buildings participating to the overall solution of the problem of reducing the, the emissions footprint of, of the built environment, right? So working very closely on, on really high achieving buildings. So one, I hope that's part of the key. I also hope that part of the key is that I'm really proud of the work that, um, that that my team and others at the Mayor's Office of Housing have been doing with the Environment Department and really walking in lockstep with seeing housing buildings as, as a potential to be a precedent setter for all different kinds of buildings, market rate housing, but also non-residential buildings across the city on how to reach zero emissions targets. So um, I've written it down, excited to follow up with Lydia and others on some of the barriers to uh, really making sure that the largest number possible of small buildings will be able to, to achieve zero emission standards. But my best answer right now is that the coordinated approach and the feedback loop that we have set up already around new construction buildings, where we're doing a lot of information sharing, both internally between housing and environment and also externally with community partners, um, that, that we'll be able to replicate that on a bigger scale to deal with some of the more complex issues that have to do with energy retrofits and happy to continue this conversation with your office and any of the other counselors in the meeting today. Great, thanks so much, Jessica. Yeah, I just, I really think that the more as we do this, we can just make sure that we're really, we're really documenting it in a way that lets it become reproducible because 20 million is a drop in the bucket compared to our retrofit needs it's only not a drop in a bucket in the bucket if it lays our pathway for how to do it with all the other thousands of units that are going to need it. So just really want to stress that. And do you guys have a sense of what the breakdown is going to be between BHA units and non-BHA units in this 20? So I, I thought that the the I maybe I don't. I thought that I <laughs> so so no. I thought that the Sorry, it wasn't the, a trap. the retrofits was private affordable housing and uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. 
um, but certainly open to conversation. It says that. It yeah. says it does, will develop yeah. programs yeah. to target, yeah. but then it does also says include. Okay. Yeah. So I guess I don't. So, okay. <laughs> so I, think, I think there's a few sub breakdowns that the committee's going to need, and that's one yeah. of them. And this home yeah. ownership sub breakdown, after you have yeah. a bit more conversation about the pricing on the condo rehabs, like yeah. there's a few of these subs that we need. And then my last question, and I've been indulgent to myself, um, and I wondered, Joel, if you could come down just on this returning citizens question, I'd love to understand a little bit better the piece Councillor Lou Jen was referencing that the BHA is doing, because I am interested in the question of how we grow that. Because my my angst about just kind of increasing support for navigators and stuff is in the end, at the end of the day, people need a unit to move into. Yeah. And my sense from the community every time I've talked to folks in the returning citizens community is that that's the rub. So um, Joel, can you just speak a little bit to what the BHA is doing? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, Joel Will, Chief of Staff of the BHA. Um, thanks, uh, Chair Bach and members of the Council. The BHA has, for the city voucher, which is funded through the operating budget, the BHA has several referral paths for different populations that may um, face extreme needs or be ineligible for federal Section 8 vouchers. And again, I want to thank the um, City Rent Subsidy Coalition that helped I advocate for this program for years. Um, one, the BHA set up a referral uh, path with Justice for Housing, which allows referral into um, the municipal voucher as well as other vouchers, including federal funded ones. Um, at present, we don't have Section 8 mobile vouchers to issue just based on the federal funding cycle. So essentially, um, we have been taking uh, a small amount of referrals um, from that nonprofit, which is led by formerly incarcerated persons um, or a person, uh, and um, which has sort of deep ties in the community. And they have partnered on some of the direct um, support uh, for the uh, people they think uh, will otherwise qualify, and then helping folks as well with sort of housing search. So. The scale of that pilot is very small, um, like 15 vouchers of, of the city voucher pool. I think we can generally say, excuse me, the BHA is committed to do more, um, whether it's through the municipal or other voucher programs. Um, with the cycle of the federal budget, I think we would likely be looking at some amount of Section 8 vouchers going to that population as well. I think there's a number of questions, but we started it small um, based on, you know, the um, group reached out to us and I'm um, in conversation with Administrator Bennett and um, our Chief of Leased Housing. We felt like we could incorporate that as one of the referral pathways where we could be a little bit more flexible uh, and, and, and attentive um, to the to the referral path, uh, excuse me, to, to, make the, to make the voucher process, which is it, heavy uh, on, the, on the federal side with documentation to make it um, easier for folks to get in. They do, it is mobile vouchers. People do still need to find um, landlords who are willing to rent to people with uh, quarries. Um, I think for the BHA's part, we see value in the partnership in that there is an advocate who's helping the tenant and applicant as well as helping to identify landlords that may be uh, so willing. So I think without taking too much of, I can answer questions or Kate can answer questions, but um, if you have further ones, I'm happy to, to talk more. No, I think that's my time and we should go to public testimony, but thank you. I appreciate it. And I just think, I think that in a number of ways, what this has underscored is that both when we're talking about, um, you know, those vouchers for returning citizens, I think when we talk about the potential to do project basing of the city vouchers to help buy down affordability of like IDP units, tax credit units, which is just, it's another it's another resource alongside Faircloth. Of course, the difference is the Faircloth we get from the feds and this we have to provide ourselves. But, and then I think when you think about the parallel idea of, of city home ownership vouchers, there's clearly appetite on the council side to growing the city supported voucher resources which I recognize is a, you know, it is a decision that has to extend beyond ARPA, but I think that's what you're hearing, or at least what I'm hearing. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to those five public testimony folks, and then I will go back to counselors. Um, and uh, I think the first one I read was uh, Michael Kane from uh, the Massachusetts um, 
it's HUD tenants, but and also the city rent uh, subsidy coalition. Sorry, Michael, reading your handwriting. Right. Um, yes. All right, uh, and Michael, as you know, if you can just state your name, affiliation. I know I did that, and then just uh, try to keep your your comments limited to. I think two is a pipe dream, but like three or four minutes, so that we can go to other oh, three <laughs> other or people. Four, I was told. That, that would be great. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you so much uh, for your patience, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Kane. I'm the director of the Mass Alliance of HUD Tenants. We organize tenants in privately owned HUD or mass housing subsidized housing developments to save their homes because they're at risk of conversion to the market. We've saved about 12,600 since 1983, uh, including several in resident owned developments. Um, we also anchor the city rent subsidy coalition because our members uh, who are predominantly low income renters uh, need subsidies to preserve their buildings. Uh, like uh, David Nolman is here today from the Forbes building in Jamaica Plain. Um, so today, uh, as, uh, Councillor Bach invited me to, we, we missed the hearing on the budget, right? So uh, uh, we were gonna support expansion of the current city rent subsidy program from a $5 million pilot to 10, to, you know, and the mayor asked for seven and a half so we want to see that, want, want you all to see that and raise it to 10 through an amendment to the budget. And I, I understand you have until the 8th to come up with those amendments, so I'm here to make that pitch. Um, the, uh, we recently met with the um, uh, BHA and they provided us the numbers on the program today, the pilot program. And I think we can report that it is a success. Uh, you've heard some people refer to it here. It's a very flexible way to meet the needs of extremely low-income people. Uh, the need, the greatest need in the city is for extremely low-income renters whose incomes are below $24,000, $25,000 a year for a family. That's the majority of low-income renters who need housing in the city. The Mayor's Housing Report identified 21,000 people like that. Uh, uh, that was before COVID. Uh, that needed housing by 2030. Uh, and that doesn't even include the thousands that uh, are still homeless today. So without low income rental subsidies, you just can't serve that population. Now the ARPA, the topic today, uh, I think the city's come up with some very creative uh, capital uh, subsidy ideas, programs that, because this is a one-time resource that should be targeted uh, carefully for one-time needs to make affordable housing, mixed income housing, feasible. Um, it's similar in that respect to the IDP, linkage, low income housing tax credit, uh, home and CDBG programs. They all are best suited for capital subsidies to bring down the costs to make them more affordable to the future uh, renters or owners. Uh, but in, uh, for rental housing, you need a deeper subsidy because that won't be enough. You just can't get it. You could give the buildings away and you, the low income renters still would not be able to pay the operating costs uh, in rental housing. So there needs to be a, an operating subsidy for them to make it work. Uh, and that's what this uh, low, city rent subsidy program uh, is accomplishing. Now, it, obviously you can have federal, state, and city resources. We fight for more federal money all the time. We've been, I was on a call today fighting for more MRVP money, which is the state subsidy. But we came to the city because the crisis is so deep, it's so big and vast, that there need to be additional resources. We pointed to the city of Washington, D.C., which has a city rent subsidy program that serves, uh, I think it, uh, it's 45 million, as last I heard, a million per year, serving uh, thousands, I think it's four and a half thousand low-income renters in that city, comparable size. So they can do it, why can't we? And we persuaded uh, Mayor Walsh to create a $5 million pilot out of the regular city budget, out of the regular city budget. And they committed to doing it on a permanent, so it's a $5 million per year commitment, so they can make commitments to owners for low income rent subsidies. So that was the idea. Well, the numbers are in, but it's a successful program. Um, as Joel just indicated, they have been tapping it for mobile vouchers to meet urgent needs, like formerly incarcerated people, like 80 families that have been assisted, with, uh, ch homeless families with children in the Boston Public Schools, which was the priority we set with the BHA a year ago. 
uh, special allocation to save 46 tenants in Brighton, uh, elderly and handicapped tenants at Babcock Towers. Uh, so those subsidies are expensive, uh, but the city is going to replace those with federal money down the road uh, for anybody that is eligible. But the program can assist people that aren't eligible for federal subsidies, such as undocumented immigrants, uh, or such as difficult to house formerly incarcerated people. So that's what they are doing with it. Those are great, flexible uses. Um, but in the long run, that money should be targeted, if it can, to mixed income permanent housing to bring the moderate income units that are tax credit or IDP funded down to be affordable, to truly, uh, truly affordable to people that need it, the extremely low income renters. So that we, we're going to work with the city to better target that money to new construction, to the IDP units that are in the pipeline. But the, it's time to raise the amount of money in the program. They've shown they can do it. They're already at the limit of $5 million a year. But they've shown it can, it's been set up. It can be readily expanded. And we need the council's help to do that. Thank you. So, Thank you so do much. That, how many minutes was that? Uh, it was uh, six and a half. Oh, so okay. well, I, I am I'm, cutting you off. I apologize. Now. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I have a memo to hand out. Yes, and you can pass that out. But I'm, I want the next person okay. to come down. Okay. So um, if I can see Barbara, Barbara Waters, and um, yeah, and I think councils have received the memo from Michael. But if not, if someone from Central Staff can get it, that'd be great. Uh, so I've got uh, Barbara Waters from the South End, um, uh, GBIO. Hi, um, my name is Barbara Waters. I am from the South End. I attend St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts. My church is a part of the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization known as GBIO. And um, I stand and come here today. I just came to come here today. I did not come to talk up here, but in terms of how I got here, I'm here. Um, listening to what was said from the mayor's office and what has been said from the city council, it puts in to more perspective for me of what the work we're doing at GBIO is truly all about. And GBIO is an organization of six, has 63 members that are interfaith organizations. We have ch church congregations, Muslims, we have um, the Jewish faith, um, several other faiths. We also have business organizations that do social service or whatever kind of work in housing. And there is such a great need and we're in the, we're in the um, process of working on three initiatives in housing and in, t in terms of um, affordable housing. And I've heard today the different names and levels about what housing could be. And in terms of reentry for those coming back in from incarceration, I've heard shared what some of the um, barriers are and how this may be able to get done and how this can't get done. And then in terms of mental health, I've kind of heard some things about what is going on with mental health. And I've also heard information shared about youth and the need in that area. And the bottom line for me and from what is going on within GBIO is that we're talking about human beings. We're talking about funds ARP, if I'm getting it right, because I'm start, starting to talk fast, but I'll slow down. The American Rescue um, Program, help me out. The uh, uh, American <coughs> Rescue American Rescue Plan Act. Yes, and if you can just speak into the mic a little bit, just because okay. it'll make it easier for the people watching at home to hear. Right, you. I'm used to saying ARPA, but I wanted to say it out. Is the people that we're talking about helping and who needs this assistance don't even know that what that is all about. But I still, I just come to say that we're talking about $206 million and how it's gonna get put around. And I'm, I just wanna hold the accountability to what GBIO was told, and I was happened to be there at the mayoral um, candidates forum where uh, Mayor Mu, <laughs> Mu, Mu, I'm sorry, who made a commitment to support um, giving money. And my understanding is $206 million. 
and that the vote will come in June. So I just stand here to ask that you do <laughs> vote. And then however the money needs to get out, it's given. There are, there are things that, um, as was discussed here, there are some that need Band-Aids, there are some that need patches, there's some that we can help work on long terms in every area. And this, the, there's enough ideas flowing around here for once the money is passed and those decisions that we can work out on doing it. And Jessica, I heard you say passionately that, oh, come in, there's things that we can help do and such. And, and I personally will call you and find out more about what you're saying. And just a little bit about me is that I live, currently live in the South End. I grew up in the South End. I have seen the regenification. I have seen the changes. I have seen the signs that have gone throughout the city of Boston at various times. Luxury condos. You, I don't hear anything about affordable housing on paper or on, on signs. And that, and when we're talking about, can we get this, can we get that? I'm hearing how the most neediest of, the, of anybody, they have the most barriers and the hoops and loops to jump through. And in our congregations and in our institutions and with statewide in terms of who makes up GBIO, our, our membership and congregation live in the Boston, we have a lot who live in the Boston area. So is my, where's my time? <laughs> uh, you're, you're at five minutes, so. Um, that is that, a, oh, I got a minute to go? No, well, <laughs> only, I made a mistake in calling Michael first, who I okay. knew. But <laughs> I'm a, oh, gee. But um, one thing I would, uh, she's not present, but um, when I heard this council person, Councilor when I heard her say, um, uh, not to come to Roxbury or whatever the people. I had to say to myself, that is the first time I've heard, you know, in terms of putting in something coming from Roxbury, say it, not in my neighborhood. So in terms of how we think and get things done, it's everybody's neighborhood and everybody is a human being. Thanks. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thanks to GBIO for all the work that you do. Um, going now to uh, Hillary Pizer online, and then it'll be uh, Minnie McMahon, and then Leslie Creedle, and then we'll go back to counselors. Um, and yeah, like I said, I sort of start, I've been very indulgent, but if folks can try to keep it more in that kind of two to three minute space, it would be helpful. Um, Hillary, you there? Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, as stated, my name is Hillary Pizer. I am representing the Massachusetts Affordable Housing Alliance from Dorchester, or MAHA. And, um, I'm just here on behalf of our members. We've graduated over 5,000 people who want to be first-time home buyers. Most of them from Boston. Most of them people of color who would like to stay in the city. Um, so we are really looking forward to working with the BHA and um, the Mayor's Office of Housing and the Council to make these resources as effective as possible. And I am really excited to hear all the energy around um, expanding the One Plus Boston program. Um, that has about the same impact as what I'm hearing on the vouchers, um, taking people from $300,000 to $450,000 in buying power. Um, and I think we have a real opportunity to enhance that in a higher interest rate um, environment. And I would love to work with the council and the other um, folks here to make that happen and possibly then pair it with the vouchers for even more affordability. So again, really happy to hear everything that's being said. And Maha membership is really engaged in this. We spent the last year and a half working on it and um, we would love to continue that involvement. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Hillary. Um, next, and, and to all of Maha. Um, next up, Minnie McMahon from uh, the um, Community Land Trust Coalition. Good afternoon, this is Minnie McMahon. Um, I live in Dorchester and I'm representing Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative and the Greater Boston Community Land Trust Network. Um, and as many of you know, something we pay attention to is a problem of displacement and how existing housing is quickly being lost to investors and speculators. And so by acquiring and attaching long-term affordability restrictions to existing units, 
um, Boston organizations like community land trusts, like CDCs, um, can ensure that many more residents are stably housed for the long term. And I want to say today that AOP has been a very supportive program for um, Boston's community land trust, so much so that we are working on developing and advocating for a statewide program that's based off of um, AOP, uses AOP as a model. And we do need ongoing and further city investment in acquisition and long-term preservation. So um, today, uh, asking the council to consider funding AOP well, at a total of $50 million, um, increasing the uh, cap to $200,000 um, per unit. Um, on average, acquisition and rehab is still more cost-effective than new construction. And again, we are uh, looking to the state for more support. And then lastly, on AOP, I don't know how we do this, but um, we don't want to see large projects siphoning off um, the support for smaller projects that face so many obstacles uh, to funding. So that's something to you know keep working on together. Uh, uh, separately, uh, going past AOP, asking for a dedicated expenditure um, to community community land trust year after year. Um, thank you to the councilors Louis Jen and Bach and and to um, the chief chief Dillon and. Jessica, for your attention to the $2 million that was allocated um, last summer, um, we'd like to see that released and, and replenished year after year. And then lastly, just want to put in a word for um, more rental vouchers to support savings and wealth building. And as Mr. Kane mentioned, to allow um, for more housing opportunities for extremely low income renters while allowing us to operate um, the buildings. And then also very interested in, you know, this potential of pairing programs um, like uh, New Beginnings Reentry Services and other really like pioneering critical um, supportive programs for returning citizens, potentially with community land trusts. So I'm really excited to hear about that and interested in continuing that um, conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Minnie. And sorry for butchering your last name. I should know it by now. Um, Okay, Leslie Creedle, you're up next. And then we're gonna go back to counselors and I'll just say to counselors, since I know that many folks are trying to get to the um, pride launch that the city's having shortly, we will just try to do six minute, like second round just for anybody who has them. Um, okay, so Leslie. Hi, thank you everybody for having me. I'm glad I made it. I'm Leslie Creedle, founder and executive director of Justice for Housing. Uh, we recently partnered as Joel mentioned uh, with the Boston Housing Authority for uh, the stabilization reintegration pilot program, which is now, we dropped a P, it's now a program. Uh, so it'll be an annual uh, program every year for returning citizens. Um, I saw a need and a gap that was being unmet. Uh, formerly incarcerated individuals were returning to the community without uh, any support and, and surrounding housing. What we have done here is created a model that is holistic in nature uh, through partnering with um, uh, social determinants of health um, organizations like Whittier Street um, and Dorchester Bay, all kind of um, financial wealth building um, organizations like the City of Boston Office of in Financial Empowerment. One of the other uh, barriers that we saw from re-entry, not only was it the quarry, it was also a credit uh, credit barrier, uh, which uh, the pilot program stabilizes. We have a stabilization plan and we, uh, we provide these resources for individuals. Our goal is creating home ownership opportunities for formerly incarcerated people returning to their communities. It reinvests wealth back into black communities, stabilizing against gentrification and addressing the wealth disparities by transforming our neighborhoods, creating generational wealth that will remain in the black community by closing Boston's racial wealth gap and creating stronger family units. Uh, and the goal of the SHARP program is to create home ownership. 
uh, is 18 month case management uh, with um, financial literacy to get their credit scores up so they're ready for that home ownership um, transition, which right now is um, being developed. We're hoping to partner with Maha and or, um, organizations like um, Urban Edge and developers, right? We need to build um, single family homes, uh, reunify our families. One of the things that we noticed also and while we were um, doing this pilot was that the reunification of family uh, happens. Uh, one of GCF's uh, requirements for, for uh, return family reunification is for uh, stabilized uh, and permanent housing. When you come home from incarceration, you don't have that. And so we have been successful in not only housing individuals, returning children to their parents uh, where they belong. And that's one of my pet peeves. Um, where we see a, a barrier right now is uh, we have resources, right? The Boston Housing is providing the, the voucher resource, but the funding for the program, uh, it costs to run the SHARP program. We provide first uh, down payments assistance. We, part, we provide the broker fee assistance, we pay for moving costs. Um, of course, these are the resources that formerly incarcerated people returning to the community don't have. And so we need to cover those costs to be in order for them to get into the units. We have developed relationships with Corey friendly landlords, Corey friendly real estate brokers. So we've gotten over the barrier of housing people um, through the quarries. Uh, now, our barrier is getting to the state and city agencies where we haven't had any, any, uh, any, any progress in getting through that door. Um, it's, it's kind of um, been hard for us to uh, get the Office of Department of Housing and Community Development to sit down with us or the mayor's office to sit down with us. And, and see how we can continue to uh, create homeowners uh, who are directly affected, right? And, and one of the, the successes we have had is lowering the recidivism rate, uh, parole and probation uh, violations are going down. So, you know, the, the impact that we are having on our community is remarkable. Uh, and only a two year old organization, uh, I think is, uh, we were invited last week to the office of the White House uh, about our policies and our programs to speak on the, uh, the president's new racial equity bill of rights. We were um, invited by HUD, Joe Who and uh, Boston Housing uh, to use the SHARP program as a model for the country. So our successes speak for itself uh, we just need our own state. We have the government who recognizes our success, but our own state hasn't really uh, recognized who we are. And so we'd like to uh, foster those relationships and, and, and build those relationships with our state and city agencies. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Leslie, um, and, and for all the work you're doing at Justice for Housing. Um, all right, I'm gonna go to counselors. Like I said, this is gonna be a tight six minute round, so not a lot of grace. Um, going first to Council President Flynn, if you have any further questions. Thank you, Council Bork. Um, I have no further questions. Just wanna say thank you to you and to the panel for um, their work and, and also for the activists across the city for their important work as well. Uh, thank you, Council Bork. Great, thank you so much, Mr. President. Uh, Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a question about um, the uh, affordability in perpetuity <laughs> question. Um, I know um, we had discussed the possibility of making agreements that would be uh, affordable for 99 years. And I was just wondering, um, is, it how, how, is that something that we should be putting a lot of effort into? Like, is it, it seems like if a, the, 
30 years is not a long time, it, it, it flies past. Uh, and all of a sudden we find that all the affordable housing we're building now is not affordable anymore and it's, it's, it's going into sort of market rate territory. Um, and just I think that that's something that would be, in terms of preserving our affordable housing for a longer period of time, it's something we should be working on. And I'd love to have your thoughts on that. We, if we are funding uh, affordable rental housing, I think uh, I think the date is it, it's since 1998 or nine. We have required affordability and perpetuity for rental housing. Um, we don't want to continue to have to rebuy affordability every 30 or 40 years. So uh, we are in agreement. Um, so uh, home ownership that uh, that has a different affordability term as it should. And we are certainly now looking at our policies uh, with, with lots of people on, on, that, on that policy and issue. But with rental, it's affordable in perpetuity uh, since 1998 or 99. So how does the rules work with um, the, um, you know, with the state fund, the Department of Health and Community um, Housing and Community Development? You know, uh, my understanding is that if, if, if it's BPDA, um, Processed, oh. it, it right. we can keep that. But if it's if it's BH, if it's if it's state, they we can't restrict uh, who applies for the affordable housing. So we could have people coming from God knows where wanting house, affordable housing in Boston. Is that how it works? I, I think I think what you're referring to, but I I'd be glad to follow up with you. Is you're you're right. The inclusionary development units, rental units, have a shorter affordability term, it's like 50 years. Yeah. And there's some permission one must seek on every single development. Um, and if we're applying for, if we're, if we're putting money in and they're putting money in, we can automatically sort of through the process get in perpetuity. But IDP has a shorter, a shorter term, I think it's 50 years. And I, we need to look at how to make that in, per, in perpetuity too. Yeah, and I think it will probably involve engaging with the state to try and see if they will allow right. us to move the goalpost a little. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, I realize it's been a long afternoon and others have questions, so that's all I have for now, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Braden. Um, Councillor Mejia. Um, you better sit down. <laughs> all right, ready? Go. The public, thank you. Now my time begins, just so you know. Um, one of the, uh, the, for the Barbara Waters for testifying, um, having grown up in the city of Boston, I have seen firsthand how the city has changed and I actually um, did an internship at the Boys and Girls Club in the South End um, in the 90s. And I have seen that whole area become what it is today. And, and so when we talk about how we're gonna move forward, as a city and how we're going to seize this moment in time in terms of investment, it's gonna really be upon us to redefine affordable and to make commitments to ensure that those who are struggling right now, Chief, are the ones that are going to uh, be the first in line to receive these supports. So to that, I'm just curious what audit and research or data you have in terms of how many people are in current need of housing. So we are refreshing our data right right now. I, I mean, you know, the last month or so, uh, with the Wu administration coming in, we, we're looking at all of our housing data. We do have data on how many low-income uh, households are rent burdened, and by you know either thirty paying more than thirty percent or more than fifty percent. I can get that over to you. Right. So then to that point, Chief, we want to make sure that those are the when we think about priorities, and when we think about COVID relief funds, when we think about all of this money, that we're going to be hyper, you know, intentional about the frontline folks, right? So right now in all of our programs, we, we can, uh, uh, with fair, fair Housing, the state allows us to prioritize up to 70% of the new affordable units developed for Boston residents. Um, we currently, do not, um, we currently do not have a prioritization uh, for those that are rent burdened. 
Mm -hmm. And I cannot tell you why we don't. Okay. So those are things that I think, you know, okay. there's been a lot of notes that we've been taking here, things that you're going to get back to us on. So I think that that's something that Absolutely. we should add to the list. Um, I just also want to underscore and uplift, um, and I do really appreciate Councillor Anderson uh, uh, really naming it in terms of the racial discrepancies that exist with between being able to provide housing for folks who are experiencing the mass and cast you know, threshold housing, but yet there's been questions around the returning citizens. So I just think that there is an opportunity for us to look at ourselves, right? Um, and to do a little bit more work in supporting um, Council Louisian's um, proposal. You don't have to speak to it. I just want you to let you know for the record that no, I'm monitoring that. No, I just want to, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm really hearing that yep. today. So I'm yep. going to take that back and work yep. on it with you all. Yep. Yes. Yeah, because if not, I'll go on Twitter and tell everybody about yep. yourself. Yep. Um, <laughs> and then uh, two more things that I just kind of want to uplift. Um, one is, uh, I'm glad that you talked about undocumented residents and immigrants. I, I think that in terms of just access to resources. When, when I think about what happened during COVID, I do know that a lot of folks who are experiencing and still continue to experience housing insecurity are those who are most vulnerable, who don't have documentation and have a hard time accessing information because they don't know how to read or write in English. So I think that as you all continue to build your infrastructure is that you're really thinking about how you're going to get this information out to reach the most vulnerable people. Um, and then uh, I just really do believe that we need an audit. Um, I'd love to see some sort of timeline with goals and objectives. Like, I, to, the, to the point of like, um, in these neighborhoods, we're going to serve X amount of people. They'll be able to, I know you had something big here, big picture thinking. But I think we need to get into the weeds a little bit more. I think oftentimes we get the administration aspirational goals, and here's what it looks like. But when we unpack it, there's really the kind of depth and information that we need is missing. So I would love to really get a sense from you in terms of your targeting. Like, how, what does that look like, look like? Can you just talk to me about that? I'm sorry, Councilor, do you mean like targeting like who, Neighborhoods, or where, or, oh, okay. People, sure. vulnerable populations, sure. like just yeah. that level of specificity. Right. Well, I, I think, you know, um, we can certainly get back to you on the land that we're proposing to develop the city on land, right, where that is. We know where that is. So we can certainly talk about that. Um, most of our affordable housing that we develop is, you know, we can, we can prioritize Boston residents, which is great. Um, we have, uh, HUD has not allowed us to do neighborhood uh, preferences, which I think some of us would like to see explored. But, um, so I think it's hard to say exactly who will be living in the, in the homes, but I think around income, income targeting, like who are we trying to serve, what incomes are we trying to serve, where the housing will be built, I think those are things that we can certainly start putting pen to paper Yeah, on. That, that would be really helpful to me as we continue to have these conversations because what you invest in and being forthcoming about that helps us better understand kind of like how to support um, these objectives. And I think, I really do believe, and I appreciate Councilor Rorel's leadership around the stipends. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to, I want to continue to underscore the importance of, while I do appreciate initiatives that are already in place for work for, for city residents in terms of plugging them into the information, we also need to, as a city, make some investments that provide them with subsidies and stipends to be able to pay their rent. Like, that is period, end of story, and you all need to figure out how y'all gonna make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, Councillor Royal? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know the city was doing an inventory on, on buildings. Do um, you know where we're at with that? And if this could be you know, a possibility to create that support of housing um, and workforce development for our returning citizens, and if opera money could be allocated to one of those developments of. Right. Uh, my understanding, and, and it's being spearheaded by the BPDA, but my understanding is that the land audit is also looking at, at city buildings. Um, so we should have, I really think we should have that inventory in a matter of weeks. And would that, would this, would, would any building within that inventory or that audit be able to be used for, you know, a development 
that is supportive housing for returning citizens? It, it could be. I don't. I don't think there's any regulatory reason why that couldn't happen. I think it. You know, some of those come down to community conversations and dialogue, and you know. Um, but yes. Yeah, that sounds like a great place for us to start exploring, and we'll love so in, to. In, so, in, in like in, in addition to not only uh, providing some form of subsidies or rent payments, also looking for actual developments to support. Right, because I think one of the biggest issues is, is housing, is actually finding the housing, finding right. the landlords. So if we're creating the housing as right. a city, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a stock, an inventory that we can always point people to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it could um, be explored. Thank you. Yeah, and then my other question is, love the, love the um, One Plus Boston program. Was kind of just wanted to see what kind of data we have around it. Do we know how many families, how many applicants were able to buy here in the city of Boston or what the purchase price of some of the loans were? We have all of that and we can get it over to you. We, we have who's buying, where they're buying, what the, I, I believe we have their mortgage amounts. We have all of that. We can get that over to you. Yeah, love to yeah. see that. Um, and no further questions. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Worrell. Uh, Councillor louis -Jen? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I thank you, uh, Councillor Worrell, for adding that. I think, uh, we, you know, we are not saying concretely this is what we must do, but we're trying to put these ideas out here and explore the different tools. You know, every year, 3,000 folks return to Boston from incarceration. And I think Leslie Cradle and a lot of our other advocates did a really good job uh, uh, of, of describing, you know, yes, and, and you know, because Kate, you've been working so closely in Joel with, with Leslie, that the work that she does and ensuring uh, you know, that her advocacy and also thinking about continuum of care um, is important. But there's also, like I, I said previously, it's a, it's a, it, there are two issues. It's that and it's finding the housing. The unit. Right, the unit. And you know, part of the reason why, from my understanding, is that we're not, one of the reasons why we're not more aggressive on the amount of, uh, these uh, city-based vouchers that we're able to allocate to the program is because we don't have enough housing, really, options to make it more viable. And so we're trying to think about what are those housing options. I support, you know, Michael King came in and said we need to continue. I want to see us increasing our city-based vouchers. I, like many, I want to see us increasing our allocation to AOP. We all acknowledge that housing for a lot of our vulnerable populations, whether they're seniors, whether they're returning citizens, is critically important. Um, and GBIO and the work that Barbara's been doing, um, I, think, I think that's the work. And I think, um, in addition, one of the things that I know Kent, uh, Councilor Bach has been talking about, the Fair Cloth Amendment, I've been talking about how we bond as a city and our ability to bond more for housing, which is something that we can do if we're really leaning into the city's fiscal strength. We have a city that is incredibly unequal, that so many people cannot find uh, housing. We know that housing should as a human right, but it also can be healing. And it can be healing for our returning citizen population, formerly incarcerated folks, providing them a place where they can see their kids. It's, it's the very basic things that Leslie was speaking to. And so um, I, I just ask that we lean in here into both our fiscal strength and what we can do as a city and into uh, working with the council to think about um, you know, su supporting additional programs um, and thinking about what we can do with this inventory once we, ha once we know uh, what, what exists um, and, and really putting some of our opera funds to, to these ideas. Um, as you can see, I think the, the council is very much interested in this idea. And as Councilor Fernand Anderson uplifted, if we can work with, if we can share, show concern to vulnerable populations that appear to be more in our face, we can definitely do it for populations that we're uplifting that we're saying have been historically excluded. My one question, sorry, I didn't expect to go on that. Um, <laughs> Ray, Tyree, but um, is about AOP and about the metrics that we're using to define success in AOP. I support this 27 million allocation. If we can do more, we should do more. What are our metrics for, for success and what AOP looks like right now and in additional allocations? So I, you know, I, I, I we are looking at, you know, is it, is it a good investment? And so far, it is cheaper. It is a cheaper, not cheaper, it's less expensive way to build permanent affordable housing. That's one. Do you think, is it the least expensive way in the city of Boston right now to ensure affordability, the AOP program? It's, it, it's the least expensive uh, 
De uh, affordable housing development, right? So I, 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 what I haven't done is compare someone with the what the cost of a voucher is over mm -hmm. so many years mm -hmm. versus the cost of of the development. That would be an interesting. But once again, even if you have the voucher, sometimes you need you need the place to go. So it is cheaper than new construction in most instances. Um, like, but I don't know if it's cheaper than a voucher for, you know, 10, 15 years, whatever the average uh, tenancy is. I think another uh, thing is that uh, we don't allow any displacement. So if people buy a building, right. you know, we're not allowing a developer to say or an owner to say, well, you know, this doesn't really, this profile doesn't fit or whatever. We're insisting that no one get displaced because of the acquisition. And I certainly think that is a, that, that is one way to measure success too. And it's stabilizing communities. And I, I'm thinking though, Councillor, I don't have a way that we are measuring that. I just know it to be true, but I think we should look at that. Like, what does that mean? If we get a critical mass, are there indicators? We, we, there's no data on people moving in and out, which I wish there was. There's just no data source. We would love that data source, but how else, how else might we um, measure community stability? Yeah, thank you. I, 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 I'm conjecturing that it probably is one of the cheaper ways to prevent displacement and to uh, uh, ensure affordability. I think that's why Minnie was talking about how they're now trying to launch a statewide. Yeah. And so I'd love for us to do more to, to, to support um, AOP, as much as a, more to support every allocation, of course, but um, what, we, what we see is working. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Councilor Louis Jen. Uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Thank you. Um, I, I heard a little bit about the condominium program. I think Councilor Coletta was asking. Um, I met with you guys, BHA, a few months ago and um, so covered the hearing order that I filed on rent to own and it's exactly that. It's converting to condos so that we can create rent to own possibilities. Where, where are you in that process? And I know it'll take time, I heard that. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Sure, so um, in terms of the condominiums, um, it's a portfolio that's funded by the state and we're in meetings with the state now to define a process for how we can transition, you know, we hope up to 50 to 60 of those units into home ownership opportunities. So right now, as you know, some have mentioned, the state requires that if a public housing unit is gonna come off the rolls, it has to be replaced somewhere. It doesn't currently allow for that unit to transition to an affordable housing opportunity. So we're working with the state on, what, on, on sort of the legal and technical aspects of how we can transition those units. Do we need special legislation? Can we find a way to meet the regulations and the statutes um, with a, a path that goes from the unit as it is as a public housing rental unit to an affordable housing unit? So I do think it's gonna take us some months to sort of um, get the right le legal and regulatory framework for that. Uh, but once we have that, we can move forward and then we wanna work with the city and local CDCs to invest in those units, again, so that we're not um, kind of show, we're, not, we're not giving low income new homeowners a, a unit that is substandard. We want to bring those units up to snuff so that they're not burdened with repairs immediately. Um, and so there's going to be a process there to, to do that capital investment. So I do think that it's, a, a, a again, a slow build for that. I, I, think, I think there are these other ways through down payment assistance for existing tenants that are in the 50 to 80 bracket of AMI and through the city voucher program where we can sort of move quickly and right away to start getting people on the rolls. I think the condo program is a, you know, it's gonna take a couple years before there's actual um, purchases happening through that program. Who initiated that? We did with the state. Nice, when did, it, when did you start that? Uh, we've been in conversations <laughs> with the state, to be honest, uh, for years about this condo portfolio um, and, and trying to put forward a number of strategies, but uh, in all honesty, it just hasn't um, been enough of a priority for us, given everything else we're doing and what's going on for us to kind of really make it happen. I think, you know, both Councillor Worrell's and Councillor Bach's advocacy has, has pushed us, uh, and, and, and these funds have pushed us to 
you know, really provide some resources and some staffing resources in Dr. Kane to be able to dedicate, you know, someone to this initiative to move it forward. Well, I've been uh, meeting with the administration. I met with one of your staff, Joel, um, and I, we talked about this. And I, I don't remember um, learning about this, but I would love to work with you, collaborate with you. Yeah, and, and apologies for that. I think, you know, for me, Rent to Own, it, it, you're right, this is rent, a Rent to Own program. And, and we, I, I think, you know, typically we think of Rent to Own as something happening possibly through MOH, uh, not just a direct kind of voucher to ownership program. So happy to follow up and talk more details. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I would love to share my policy brief. Um, it, it's all there. Um, the, you know, condoizing, the down payments, the programs, the, rent, the refurbishing or re renovation of buildings already existing, um, housing, uh, city owned or state owned. Um, yeah, it's all there. So I, it sounds like great minds think alike. You know? <laughs> um, thank you. Thank and you. I guess, um, Chief Dillon, what, so in, in terms of data, you know, we're talking about like, how do we know, what are the return investments? How do we tracking this stuff? Especially with ARPA dollars, right? We know who it impacts and we know what, this, what the Fed said. Like this money should go to people that is disproportionately impacted by COVID. So I think that it's almost, um, you know, sort of counterproductive to spend, to say there's a need, let's spend the money, right? There's a need, here's a great idea, let's spend the money. But then if we're not actually intentional, and I think that everyone is in their own like heart and minds, like you want to do your job well. But the intention, I think, is in you know using metrics, right, mm -hmm. to follow this and say, say the population is um, in Boston, you know, ma the, the majority, the minorities are the majority. We know that this 60 million should house majority people of color, mm -hmm. right, and then it should also house majority Black people, but it should also house majority Black Americans, right? Because, and I'm saying in that in that percentage. Um, because it clearly states who is impacted. It clearly states that black Americans were disproportionately mostly impacted. And I think that when we're having, when we're making, putting plans in place to spending this money yeah. with every department, yeah. right? And I talk about this all the time. Conversations about race, inequities, and systemic oppression is hard to be had, however necessary. So. If we're going to be intentional about how we spend money in order for it to be the magic word, da da da, equitable, it's we will need to say this is the plan of implementation. This is how we will measure that we've actually did it the right way. And I think that's what we're looking for. If there's a dashboard of some sort and that by way of creating transparency and also breaking down those metrics so that we are supportive of something that we're calling equitable. I, I could not agree more, and I know that there is co internal conversations going on right now in the administration about looking at the ARPA spends across the divisions, like you said, and I, I do think we need very good information on who's benefiting from this housing, and not just who's buying a unit or who's renting a unit, also the economic activity. So if we're building a lot of new housing, um, if so, that needs to be tracked as well. Who is benefiting? How are these resources getting in the hands of communities? And and who? So I, I do think that we will only be success. We we need to be able to look back on at the end of the two or three or four year period where ARP is being spent and point ve to very intentional outcomes. So I agree with you. Thank. You. In my opinion, I think we should stop calling deeply affordable. We should stop using that term. We should say affordable just means affordable. And we should no longer consider 70% AMI, 80%, 100% AMI affordable for home ownership. And to Council Lujan's point, we should be honest. This is not affordable for the majority mm -hmm. of the people mm -hmm. that need it. And to undo harm is to be sincere because there is no reconciliation without truth. So I think in, to support you moving forward, if any systems of systemic uh, racism or oppression we have to be able to hold each other accountable, but we have to work together 
both you as my white sister, me as your black sister, to be able to say, look, this is not to jeopardize or compromise your position and your livelihood and your job, but rather that I'm in a system that I know that I have to fight, but although I'm invested in it because it pays my bills. Mm -hmm. But that we together are in this system, and how are we going to do that intentionally is by having that conversation and saying, this is not affordable, and being honest mm -hmm. moving forward in what we can and cannot do. So I appreciate your responses in the way that you all have um, spoken today, because when you didn't know, you said, I don't know. Um, but we can't keep doing that, right? Like at some point, we have counselors have to hold ourselves accountable and come to you and say, hey, chief, I'm here. How can I help? So I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councilor Fernandez Anderson. And yeah, I agree. I think great minds think alike. I was laughing slightly to myself because I, I, I was laughing because I'm actually the one who originally did the spreadsheet for the BHA of the scattered site portfolio <laughs> three years ago. Um, when I was a staffer there. So I know it has, in fact, been something they've been working on for a while, but I agree that um, that it's obviously in the same direction as what you were thinking of, and a lot of the properties, I think, are split mainly between yours and Councilor Worrell's districts. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to try to accelerate that work um, together. Uh, all right, I, um, I think I, we've got a bunch of informational follow-ups for the committee to yeah. do with you all, um, but I feel like I know where you all are, so I'm not gonna take my um, second round. So I'll just, and I don't see anybody else signed up for public testimony. Um, if, like, I'm saying this hesitantly because as you all know, my chief of staff, Emily Brown, is uh, deeply involved in the LGBTQ ERG, and so I am very personally invested in getting to the Pride festivities. Um, but if anybody had a burning question they wanted to put on the record, no, just joking. Okay, yeah, no, so that's cut off. Not, I already gave you the speech. That was the last few minutes. Anything else? No, no, I meant, I meant for... <laughs> oh, for LGBTQ, yes, yes. We're not doing that now. We're trying to get everybody there. Um, okay, all right, so I think, you know, obviously there will be f further follow-up. Yep. want to remind folks who are watching this afterwards, ccc.covid19 at boston.gov is the email you can send testimony to. We'll be back Friday morning talking about climate and mobility and digital equity, and then Friday afternoon on public health and behavioral health. And then we'll kind of be figuring out, once we've gone through this kind of initial set of proposals, next steps for the council processing this um, before we take any vote on appropriation. Um, but, uh, but I know that, you know, we continue to balance this tremendous sense of like, this is one-time money, we have to get it right. You know, you've heard me, Chief, talk about the fact that you know this needs to be stuff that's yes answering urgent things but participating in systemic solutions and and really leaving a lasting impact and that we're creating good jobs with and we're building the public role with um, and i think you've heard a lot of counselors say we need to we want the measurements built baked in so that we don't feel like we're saying yes now and then later down the road it doesn't turn out to be what we yeah. and our constituents hoped it would be and and all of that we're balancing against um, the enormous pressure we heard from Barbara around the, hey, our people need this money, we're in a housing crisis, especially on that, right, on this housing front, like, can we get the money out the door? And so, you know, I think we're all gonna continue to um, figure out together that balance for how to get these dollars hitting the ground in an accountable and in a lasting way. So, looking forward to that work ahead. And with that, this hearing of the Boston City Council's Committee on Boston's COVID-19 Recovery is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.